our first item of business is to call the meeting to order. And so we will call the Metropolitan Planning Commission November 12th, 2020 meeting to order. I want to welcome all of the commissioners and the public and the team uh, on the call. I, I want to say thank you for everybody for allowing us to continue to do it in this uh, much safer format, especially as the numbers for COVID cases continue to rise. So with that said, uh, our item B, which is we need to establish uh, that a COVID-19 requires um, a telephonic meeting is permitted under executive order number 16. And I want to hand that over to our attorney, Alex. And Alex, are you on the line? Yes, uh, Alex Dickerson with Metro Legal. Um, so the motion that you'll need to have, and before we talk about the motion, I do want to remind everyone that the new governor's executive order requires that if you are speaking, be it as a commission member, a staff member, or a guest, um, including council members, that you need to verbally identify yourself before you speak. Um, and if for some reason you're called upon by your name, you don't have to identify yourself then. Um, but otherwise, if if, um, if it's not clear from the context of the speech who is speaking, please identify yourself for the record so we're in compliance with the governor's executive order. And with that, uh, the motion that we're looking for is that the proposed agenda constitutes essential business of this body and that meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and well-being of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And so... Commissioners, you've heard our attorney. The motion would need to be that the meeting, uh, that this meeting uh, electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Any planning rules that are in conflict with the governor's order are hereby temporarily suspended until the governor's order is no longer in effect. And so, commissioners, um, if you would raise your hand or... Chairman, this is Lucy. Forgive me for interrupting. I'm just check I want to have a quick procedural note because I know that this item is is different um, for the remote meetings, but do we need to call roll before we take the vote on the the remote meetings order or can we do it? Yeah, no, with it? Okay. No, that's okay. Let's uh, uh I'm getting ahead of myself. I apologize for that, Director. Um so Let's go ahead and, and do roll call um, first. And so commissioners, if you will um, say present when I call your name and that will serve as a roll call. So Commissioner Blackshear. Present. Vice Chair Farr. Present. Commissioner Haynes. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Present. Council Lady Murphy? Present. Commissioner Sims? Present. And this is Commissioner Atkins, and I'm present as well. And so thank you, uh, Director Kemp, for uh, making sure I stay on track, which is always helpful. And so we have a quorum. And so we heard from our attorney um, about the motion. And let me repeat the motion, what the motion would be, and then we'll get uh, a commissioner if they want to do a motion. So the motion would be that um, is that meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Any planning rules that are in conflict with the governor's order are hereby temporarily suspended until the governor's order is no longer in effect. And so, um, Vice Chair, do you want to make that motion? Sure, I will uh, make the motion you just stated. Thank you. And Commissioner Haynes, you want a second? Second. And that's a proper motion and second. Any discussion? If you would raise your icon hands or state that you'd verbally like to discuss. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, we are ready for a roll call. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Councilor Murphy. 
Commissioner Sims. Uh, aye. Aye. Ayes have it, and the motion um, passes that to have a telephonic meeting, and I appreciate that um, from everyone. And so, like I was saying earlier, I want to say thank you for um, the public's patience and the commissioner's patience in allowing us uh, to do this telephonically. I think it's um, in talking with our executive committee and, and the leadership and the director. It, um, we are doing the best we can in keeping the city moving forward, but also being safe. And I, I want to say thank you. So just a few um, housekeeping uh, notes. Uh, first, you know, please mute your line when you're not speaking. Um, and that will really help with, with keeping uh, the feedback on the line um, down to a minute. I appreciate everybody doing that. And then also just um, to note, um, that when I say icon, your icon, when I say raise your hand, it's the icon hand in the app. Um, or you can verbally state that you want to speak at any time, commissioners. Um, and we'll go slow and we'll make sure that we, we get to everyone. And um, I appreciate everybody uh, being here. And so now we, we are on uh, item C, which is uh, the adoption of the agenda. And that was sent out to you earlier um, and also posted on the website. And so we will need a motion uh, to adopt the agenda. Is there, if you'll raise your so icon. Uh, thank you. That was Commissioner Lawson uh, made the motion. Is there a second? Uh, if you'll raise your. This is Pearl and Sims. I'll, I'll second it. Commissioner Sims, thank you for the second. And is there any discussion, edits, or on the agenda. If you would raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to discuss. Seeing none, we are ready for a roll call to approve the agenda. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Ayes have it, and the agenda is adopted. And now we are on, on to item D of the agenda, which is the approval of the October 22nd, 2020 minutes. And those minutes have been sent to you and also posted on the website. And so we will need and we will need a motion to approve the minutes. And Councilor Murphy, you want to make a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. That's a proper motion. And Commissioner Blackshear, you want a second? Second. Okay. That's a proper motion. Second. Any discussion? If you would raise your icon hands or verbally state that you would like to speak. And see, seeing, seeing none, we are ready for a roll call vote. On the minutes, Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Abstain. Council Lady Murphy. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Eyes have it, and the minutes are adopted, and now we are on to the recognition of the council members. And so we, um, Lisa and I have been watching the council members uh, when they get on the app, and so just like we do in our meeting, the first ones that we see, uh, we'll, we're going to call on uh, the, those folks, and then... Um, as a reminder, also, you know, the council members can also speak during their items. So it's really up to the council members or, or both. So first, we saw Councilman Withers. Thank you so much, Chair Atkins. Uh, I am on items, I think, 25 and 26, and I will wait to speak on those items. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you being on the call. Next was Councilman Sean Parker. Hi, 
Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you all for being here. Um, I, uh, this is, uh, I'm not sure if I need to introduce myself. This is, this is council member Sean Parker. Um, I've got, um, <clears throat> district five has two items on the agenda. Um, we've got the expansion of the urban zoning overlay. Um, this covers a small portion of district five, which is sort of the Northern half of the East Hill neighborhood. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of questions from constituents about this. Um, mostly just folks wanting to understand what it is. I think that almost every, I think everyone that I've spoken with um, and sort of clarified what it would, what it would do um, has been supportive. So I haven't really heard any opposition to this and um, I'm supportive of it. I think that uh, it's gonna help make our neighborhoods more walkable and I think it's a great thing. So I really appreciate um, council member Benedict's work on that. Um, this expansion is largely contained within district seven um, but we're happy to be a part of it as well. Um, and the other item I have is uh, 111 North First Street, which the last I heard was still on consent. Um, this project is a regulatory SP for um, what folks at home might know as the travel center site there um, that you see when you're going over the James Robertson Bridge. Um, so th this is a, a regulatory SP that would um, allow for some mixed use development there. I, uh, I do agree with staff's recommendation on this and I do appreciate the, the hard work of um, planning and the applicant uh, as well as um, Mark Sturdivant um, in, his, in his former and current capacities to, um, to help get this plan together. So I'm, I'm supportive of that one as well. And um, again, thank you all for being here. And I'll be on the line for a while. I've got a neighborhood meeting to get to, but I might be here if, uh, if there's any questions during the uh, UCO expansion for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. We appreciate you being on the line. Next, we saw um, Council Member Gamble. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's Councilwoman Gamble, and I am speaking on item number 22. It's a proposed partial a USD annexation for the southern uh, part of the district. This would is contiguous with uh, ending a barrier of USD and it's extending it north uh, for a few miles. It includes about 1,500 parcels. And this area, there's been a lot of interest in expanding this area in the USD uh, for years. There are quite a few rental properties in the area and we've had a, for a long time issues with trash uh, because for whatever reason, uh, people are not uh, paying private vendors to pick up their trash, they're dumping trash. Also uh, the lack of lighting, there's quite a few elderly uh, individuals that live in this area that don't feel safe at night because it's pitch black. And so there's been a lot of interest uh, for uh, having uh, going into the USD so that they could get the trash and, and, and lighting services uh, through through Metro with the uh, in that annexation. So I, I look forward to uh, answering any questions about it. We've had quite a few uh, community meetings, a lot of community engagement uh, since uh, last year, last October, actually quite a few meetings, quite a few. Um, uh, communications about it. So I look forward to to discussing it uh, later in on the agenda and answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. I appreciate it. Next, we saw Councilor Lady Van Rees. Yes, hello. I'm, I'm also here to uh, answer any questions or um, kind of chime in when we get to the item concerning the UZO expansion. Of course, with it needing to be contiguous, I need District 5 to be happy about it, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that things are okay, Sean. Uh, I am uh, very uh, eager to um, talk about this more when it comes up on the uh, uh, agenda, and uh, we'll hold comments until then. Thanks so much. Thank you, Council Lady. Next, uh, Council Member Stiles. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Commissioners, for your time today. I am here in reference to item 15, which is a rezone from an SP to an MUL zoning. 
on Crossings Boulevard. This is actually going to be going to a school, Rocket Ship Academy. They have come to several community meetings. We've talked about the logistics of the land, making sure that it was a good fit, not only for the community, but also for the children. Several of our residents attend one of their other locations, and this provides the families with an opportunity to stay closer to home. So I will be available for questions as we get to it on the agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Lady. Next is Council Member Benedict. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioners. Uh, I have three items on the agenda. Uh, number 16 and number 19 are on consent. Um, and then number 25, as you've heard three of my colleagues talk about, that's the expansion of the UZO. Um, it has been supported widely. The bulk of that expansion is in District 7, and um, folks are thrilled to seem to be. Um, they had questions, as a couple of my colleagues mentioned, uh, but overall, once those questions were answered, they're uh, glad to have this come in their way. So hopefully we'll see that in the hearing tonight as well. If there are any concerns, they seem to have all been answered. Uh, but certainly would be glad to expand upon that when we get there, if needed. Thanks so much. Thank you, Council Liddy. And so I think that that is all of the council members. Lisa, did you see any other council members? I want to make sure we're take care of it. Hi, Hi Chairman. Um, I do not see any additional council members on the line. Okay. Th thank you, Lisa. And... So that concludes uh, our recognition of the council members, which is agenda item E. And so now we are on to agenda item F, which is the items for deferral withdrawal. And I think Lisa is going to do that. Hi, Chairman. That's right. This is Lisa Milligan with Metro Planning. The following items are for deferral or withdrawal. Item number one, 2020Z012TX001 on page three of your agenda. It's a request for an ordinance to amend the zoning code. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 10th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. Item number two, 2019S109001, Richards Farm Subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 10th Planning Commission meeting. Item number three on page four of your agenda, 2020S113001, a resub of Dixie Pure Food Company subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number four, 2020S145001, the Bordeaux Agrihood subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 10th Planning Commission meeting. Item number five, 2020S176001, a resubdivision of a plat and swing bridge subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 10th Planning Commission meeting. Item number six, 2020SP045001, Kubota of Whites Creek Pike. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 10th Planning Commission meeting. Item number seven, substitute BL202197. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 21st, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. Item number eight, 2016 SP 083003, 50 Music Square West, Amendment 1. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 10th Planning Commission meeting. And I would note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 10, 2020Z102PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 10th Planning Commission meeting. And I would like to note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 10A, 2020CP011001, South Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 10th Planning Commission meeting. The associated case 10B, 2020 SP 048001, 101 Factory Street Multifamily SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 10th Planning Commission meeting. And on page eight of your agenda, item number 24, 2020 Z119PR001. This is a rezoning for various properties within Germantown. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 21st, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. 
Thank you, Lisa. And did you say item number nine? Is it? Yes. Okay. So, uh, commissioners, uh, you've heard the items, but we'll go through these. And Lisa, if you'll make sure that I'm uh, stating the items that are on the consent agenda correctly. Items number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10A, 10B, and 24. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you, Lisa. And so, commissioners, you've heard the items for the uh, for deferral or withdrawal. And so, we are now on to. We will need a motion to defer those items, Vice Chair. Sure, I'll make a motion to. Um adopt the list of items for deferral. Thank you. Vice Chair Farr makes that motion. And is there a second? Second. Commissioner Lawson seconds it. And any discussion, if you would raise your icon hand in, your, in the app or verbally state you'd like to discuss. And seeing none, we are ready for a roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Councilor A. Murphy. Councilor A. Murphy. Chairman, Council Lady Murphy um, had to step away from the meeting, um, oh, okay. and um, and so uh, once she rejoins us, I'll send you um, a note. Thank you, Commissioner Sims. Aye. Ayes have it, and those items are deferred. So now we are on to item G, which is the consent agenda items. And Lisa, are you going to do that as well? I am chairman. Um, as information, as information for our audience, if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the planning commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. Please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent agenda. On page five of your agenda, item number 11, 2020 SP 046001, Newtown Infill Homes. It's a request to rezone from RS 7.5 to SP for property located on Raymond Street to permit seven multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page six of your agenda, item number 12, 2020 SP 047001, 111 North 1st Street. It's a request to rezone from IR to SP for property located at 111 North 1st Street to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 13, 2020 SP 049001, 3124 Murfreesboro Pike. It's a request to rezone from AR2A to SP for property located on Murfreesboro Pike to permit 136 multifamily residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 14, 1686P001, the Hermitage Markets Place revision and final. It's a request to revise the preliminary plan and for final site plan approval for a portion of a commercial PUD located on Old Hickory Boulevard to permit, 2000, uh, to permit a 2,300 square foot restaurant. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 16, 2020Z043 PR, I'm sorry, item number 15, 2020Z043 PR001, 
It's a request to rezone from SP to MUL zoning for a portion of property at 5400 Mount View Road. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 16, 2020Z 127PR001. It's a request to rezone from R6 to RM15A for property located at 1119 Chester Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. On page seven of your agenda, item number 17, 2020Z 129PR001. It's a re request to rezone from RS5 to R6 for property located at 340 Peachtree Street. Staff recommendation is to disapprove R6 and approve R6A. Item number 18, 2020Z 130PR001. It's a request to rezone from CS to RM20A for property located on Dickerson Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 19, 2020Z 132PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS10 to R10 for property located at 1310 Cardinal Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 20, 2020Z 133PR001. It's a request to rezone from R8 to IWD for property located at 437 Haney Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 21, 868P004. The Harding Place Center PUD revision and final. It's a request to revise the preliminary plan and for final site plan approval for property located on Harding Place to permit two hotels. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. And under other business on page nine of your agenda, item number 27, contract renewal for Marty Stuhl and Sean Shepard. Item number 28, a bonus height certification for 801 and 900 Church Street. Item number 29, contract renewals for Anna Greider and Michelle Hollingsworth. And item number 33, to accept the director's report. Thank you, Lisa. And so commissioners, uh, you've heard the items, but Lisa, if you'll follow along, make sure I have these right for the commissioners, the items on the that will be on the consent agenda motion. And so it would be items number 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 27, 28, 29, and 33. Is that correct, Lisa? That is correct, Chairman. Okay. And so, Commissioners, we are ready for a motion to adopt the consent agenda. And Commissioner Johnson, you haven't made a motion yet. Would you like to make a motion to adopt the consent agenda? Sure, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I make a motion to adopt, adopt all the consent item agenda. Thank you. That's a proper motion. And is there a second, Commissioner Sims? I second it. All right. It's a proper motion and second. Any other discussion? If you would raise your icon hand or verbally state you would like to discuss the consent agenda. And seeing none, hearing none, no one. We are ready for roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Ayes have it and the consent agenda is adopted. And so I believe that the items that we will be hearing tonight, and Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but um, are items 22, 23, 25, and 26. Is that correct, Lisa? Yes, that's correct. Excellent. So we have four items, commissioners, and we are now on to item H, which is the items to consider. And so we are moving um, on to the public hearing. Um, and for listeners at home, we've provided multiple ways to participate in this telephonic meeting. Normally, we take the applicant first and then supporters and then opponents. But because of the different ways for people to participate, we'll be taking supporters and opponents together. Um, 
And to help us, please state your name, your address, and whether you support or oppose the particular item. As usual, we took emailed comments through Tuesday at 3 p.m. At the start of each public hearing, Lisa will give a summary on how many email comments that were received on an item. Um, we have a call-in number for members of the public who wish to call in and testify for the public hearing. Um, and please wait until the public hearing um, in which your item uh, begins before calling. It's a queue system, so you don't have to wait until the next speaker, uh, you call in immediately when your item comes up. Um, and so uh, also, um, if you're calling in, please be aware that there is a legally required 30 second delay. So that means that if you watch it on your screen, it's going to confuse you and um, uh, when you're commenting. So it will be slightly behind. So just focus on on your, your comments on the telephone. It works best um, to ignore the screen. And, and like I said, to, to focus uh, on the telephone. For each item, we'll also let you know um, when to call in, uh, when, the, when we are taking public comment. Um, I will ask Lisa for the count of email comments for each item. Um, and so, again, the items we're going to consider tonight are items 22, 23, 25, and 26. And so, with that, it brings us to our first item. Item number 22. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is Greg Claxton with the Planning Department. I'll be presenting item 22, a proposed uh, expansion of the USD. Slide. Um, as background, the Metro Charter establishes two service districts, the General Service District, or GSD, which covers the entire county, and the Urban Service District, or USD, uh, which um, went at the time of charter adoption covered the historic uh, city of Nashville, but has been ex expanded several times since then. The additional functions of the, the Urban Services District include additional police protection, fire protection, water, sewer, and st stormwater service, street uh, lighting and cleaning, refuse collection, and wine and whiskey supervision. Slide. The charter also lays out a, a process for expanding the area of the USD when areas of the General Services District need urban services and when Metro can provide such services within a, um, one year after taxes in the area are due. Uh, expansion require, requires a plan of services to this effect. Um, on screen, the map shows the original USD at the time of the consolidation of metropolitan government. Slide, um, it has been expanded several times since then. Slide, and Lisa just go through, yep, 1970s, 2000s, and 2010s. The last time the USD was expanded was in 2016. Um, okay, now slide. Um, the map on the right shows the area proposed uh, uh, for the, the current expansion. Uh, this area was originally considered in the last expansion in 2016, but ultimately not included. Uh, as she discussed during uh, uh, during her comments, Councilmember Gamble has been working with the area for um, at least the last year, um, particularly over the last year. Um, she hosted multiple community meetings about the expansion, some within the expan expansion area and some outside of it. Uh, the council member also routinely mentioned the expansion in her other uh, district meetings and newsletter. Slide. <clears throat> Uh, generally, we, we consider USD expansion uh, in areas that are, have already been developed in a suburban pattern or that have a suburban zoning um, or areas that are predominantly served by utilities such as water and sewer or that are, are already served by police and fire. And then additionally, we look to the, the land use policies um, and kind of what they recommend for future development in Nashville next slide. Generally, we do, uh, do not look for USD expansion in areas that are low density with rural land use policies or that are satellite cities such as Bellmead, Forest Hills, Oak Hill, Goodlitzville. Slide. Um, Planning Commission makes a recommendation to Council regarding the plan of services for the proposed expansion. This is a proposal outlining how Metro will provide the required services and pay for them over time. Uh, this is uh, put together from estimates that are provided by Public Works and Finan Finance, and the Finance Director signs off as to the availability of funds as part of the Council process. Uh, the plan of services for this expansion includes installation of new streetlights, recycling, recycling collection, and trash collection. 
and uh, the following services are already gen generally provided to the area, police and fire protection, water, sewer, and storm sewers, and street cleaning. Slide. Uh, this slide shows the uh, GSD rate and USD rate um, currently in effect, and then shows the calculations for estimating revenue uh, from the total assessed value of the, the area currently, uh, what the, the uh, annual tax increase would be at, at, at these rate levels. Slide. And then the plan of services shows uh, kind of how the, the, the costs versus the revenues balance out over time. Uh, the first year cost includes um, the annual cost to serve the area as well as the startup cost of, of starting to provide either uh, installing through capital or you know, adding these uh, services to routes, that kind of thing, as well as the, the ongoing annual cost of providing uh, USD services over time. It also shows the annual revenue and then the variance. Um, and we have found that uh, in the future, the, the annual variance will pay off the first year uh, variance. So it is something that, that, that pays for itself over time. Slide. Um, as a, uh, just to reiterate, the benefits of uh, expanding USD to this area would be uh, trash and recycling collection now now provided through the, the tax base, um, as well as the addition of streetlights, which make neighborhoods safer for walking and driving at night and can help neighborhoods reduce and monitor unwanted activities at night. Additionally, any new development will have sidewalks required on new local streets. Slide. Uh, we also took a look at Nashville Next and the policy for this area and found that the current policies and development patterns align with USD services. In particular, the area includes commercial services along Dickerson Pike, uh, as several established suburban neighborhoods, as well as development opportunities for new suburban neighborhoods. Slide. In doing our review, uh, we identified two split properties that had not been included uh, in the public works and finance assessment. Um, if not included, these properties would be small dots of the general services district entirely surrounded by the USD. And because of that, staff recommends including these in the USD expansion. Slide. Um, the current schedule, uh, this, uh, the bill for this expansion passed Metro Council first reading on October 20th. Uh, Planning Commission considers it tonight. Um, on December 1st, Metro Council will have second reading and a public hearing. Um, and then has the, the opportunity to adopt it on third and final reading on December 15th. Slide. If adopted, uh, if this bill is, is, is passed, um, it, properties in the annexed area would be uh, included, would be identified as USD on assessment rolls starting January 1st. Taxes will become due at the, the USD tax rate on, in October of 21. That will start the one-year clock for fully implementing services, uh, which must be concluded by October of 22. Public Works notes that, that generally they're able to uh, provide services uh, earlier within the one year rather than like right at the end of the one-year timeline. Slide. And with that, uh, staff recommends approval of the, the, the expansion uh, with the, the two amended properties. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And so now we'll open the item for public hearing. And I believe, is the council member the, the requester or is it the applicant? Yes. Excellent. And so um, we heard uh, from the council lady earlier, but Councilor Gamble, would you like to say a few words or say anything else? Uh Thank you, Chairman. I just forgot to mention earlier that this would uh, this annexation we believe will help improve the quality of life in the area by reducing uh, trash dumping, adding recycling, and also uh, street lights to make it safer. Uh, so, with that, I'll open up to any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Council Lady. And so now we are uh, ready to take calls from. Uh, members of the public who wish to call in. So your screen should show the call in number now. So please call in. You don't, as I stated before, you don't have to wait uh, because we will put you in a queue. Um, and so we appreciate everybody doing that. As a reminder, please only call in on the current case. And so we're on case number 22. Uh, when you begin your testimony, please state your name, address, and whether you support or oppose the item. We're not able to display the timer visually, so Sean will let you know 
you have two minutes to speak and Sean will let you know when you have 30 seconds left and then she will also let you know when your time is, has ran out. We appreciate everybody uh, staying within the two minutes of um, their, their discussion. Um, and so uh, while we wait for the callers to get into the queue, Lisa, did we have any emails on this item? Hi, Chairman. This is Lisa Milligan. We did not receive any emails on this item. Okay, thank you. And Sean, do we have any callers ready? Chair, this is Sean Shepard in the call center. At this time, we don't have any callers, so we'll take a pause in case anyone's trying to reach us, and then I'll check back in. Thank you. Chair, this is Sean at the call center again. We do not have any callers in the queue for this item. Okay, thank you, Sean. And so uh, let's check with the council member one more time. Anything else before we close the public hearing, Council Lady? And then no, uh, thank you, Chair. I don't have any more to add. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. And Chair, this is uh, Council Member Van Rees. May I be recognized? Sure. Yeah, Council Lady Van Yeah, I, want, I wanted to wait until uh, after everyone had a chance to speak if they did, but I, I just want to congratulate um, a fellow council member. Uh, having gone through this process uh, in the past, I know that uh, it takes a, an, an extreme amount of diligence. And uh, as the council member across the street, as I like to say, uh, I am, I'm very excited uh, for the community that she represents, uh, I know that the almost, what was it, 971 street lights that we uh, added in in 2016-17 um, has made an immense amount of difference in public safety, um, the trash collection and recycling, uh, the sidewalk recommendations, the fact that such a large portion of this area is uh, the Skyline Commons uh, commercial footprint, uh, also uh, re- uh, underscores the ability for uh, District 3 to be able to add tax dollars to the coffers um, when that redevelops. And I just wanted to um, uh, thank her for her uh, diligence on this effort of not only being able to take care of her neighborhoods, but uh, keeping the entire city in mind. And I just wanted to take a moment to say that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Lady, and I concur 100%. Appreciate that. Um, and so now, uh, so Chairman Atkins, else... yes. sorry, this is, this is Sean at the call center again. I'm sorry to interject, um, but we have, we have received a phone call and confirmed that it is someone who wishes to speak to the commission on this item. Okay. Let's bring him in. Chairman, you have the caller. All right, welcome. And please state your name and address, and you have two minutes. Um, Ma'am, uh, we, I know that I cannot hear you. Sean, can you hear the caller? Chair, we, we have gotten disconnected from the caller. Um, we will give a moment to see if she tries us back and then try to patch her back in. Thank you.
Chair, this is Sean at the call center. Um, the caller has not yet attempted to call us back, um, so I just wanted to give you that information um, so you can consider. We're, we'll follow your lead on whether you want to continue waiting, um, and I can let you know if we do receive a call. Well, let, let's do um, about let, let's do another minute, and then and then let's do one minute, and then um, if if that person hasn't called, then then we'll move on. Let's do one more minute, okay, Sean? Let us that know. sounds great. I will keep Thank an you. eye on the clock and check back in with you. Thank you. We we want to make sure that we try to get everyone that calls in. Chair, we do have the caller trying back. Bear with us just a minute and we'll get her patched in. Thank you. Chair, you have the caller. Thank you. Welcome. And we appreciate you calling in and you have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address. Go ahead. Yes. My name is Teresa Burst and I live at 2536 Solomon Lane in Nashville in District 3. And I just wanted to state my um, approval of the expansion that is up for discussion right now. Um, I think the inclusion and the ability to be able to have street lights on our neighborhood and just to be included in the metro would be um, very beneficial for um, our neighborhood and some of the new subdivisions that are coming up there. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you very much for calling in. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, council member, uh, I, I wanna make sure you're okay to close the public hearing. Are you, uh, anything else you wanna say? Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I'm ready to close the public hearing. Excellent, so seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed and now it's time for discussion of the, the commission members. And so um, there's been no, um, public opposition um, with emails and or uh, calls. So it, let's try this. I, I mean, I wanna make sure every commissioner um, wants to discuss, but if maybe we can, are there any commissioners that wanna discuss or maybe we'll try a motion and then we'll see if anybody else wants to discuss. Commissioner Farr, you wanna make a motion? Sure, I'll make a motion that we accept staff's recommendation. For approval, thank you. Proper for approval. Motion. And is there a second? Second. Commissioner Lawson seconds. And is there any discussion? If you would raise your icon hand or if you want to speak, please verbally state that you would like to speak. And seeing none, we are ready for a roll call vote. And before we do the roll call, I just want to say good job to, to the council member. Commissioner Blackshear. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Is Council Lady Murphy on the line yet? I just want to. Let me. She's not. Go. Okay, thank you, Director. Commissioner. This is Lucy Kemp. No, she's not. <laughs> oh, thank, you, thank you, Director Kemp. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Eyes have it, and item 22 is approved. We are now on to item number 23, and I believe that Jason, Mr. Swagger, is going to do the presentation. Okay, hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Swagger. Great. My name is Jason Swaggart. I will be presenting item 23 on behalf of the Metro Planning Department. Next slide. This is a request to amend the preliminary for the one city specific plan by increasing the number of permitted residential units. Next slide. 
Staff is recommending approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Next slide. The area shaded in gray is within the one city specific plan boundary. The development was originally approved in 2011 for a variety of commercial and residential uses. It was amended twice in 2014. The first amendment increased the maximum height in the SP. The second amendment increased the maximum number of residential units from 300 as originally approved in 2011 to 600. To date, the development contains approximately 276 residential units, office, retail, restaurant, and recreational uses. A hotel is under construction at the corner of City Boulevard and 28th Avenue North. Final site plan is currently under review for a 261 residential unit building. Next slide. This slide shows part of the regulating document in the SP. The amendment is to increase the maximum number of residential units from 600 to 850. The amendment only requires the number circled in red of this page to be updated. Next slide. This is in the Green Hills Midtown Community Plan. The policy is urban mixed use neighborhood. The urban mixed use neighborhood policy is intended to create and enhance mixed use areas. Areas within these policies are intended to be among the most intense areas in Davidson County. The proposed increase in density is consistent with the policy and is appropriate given the site's location on Charlotte Pike, which is a mixed use corridor and the site's proximity to downtown. In conclusion, staff is recommending approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, sir. And we will open this item for public hearing and is the applicant on the line? Sean. Chair, this is Sean Shepard in the call center. We do have representatives from the applicant on the line and they are unmuted um, and able to be recognized. Okay, welcome. And the applicant, you'll have 10 minutes for your presentation and you can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. Please state your name and address and you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Hal Clark. Uh, I'm a principal with CSDG here in town. And uh, uh, Mr. Swagger did a great job of presenting the, uh, the project and the request. And uh, it's, it's very simple, just uh, a request uh, to, to uh, increase the permitted residential units uh, to 850 and uh, we'll just save a little time for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And so now um, we'll save two minutes uh, of your of your time for rebuttal. And so now we're ready for call-ins. And so the members of the public who wish to call in, please call in now. Your screen should now show the call-in number. As a reminder, you don't need to wait because to call in because you'll be placed in a queue um, and it's very helpful if you call in. So we are on item number 23, so please call in on this particular item. Uh, when you begin your testimony, please state your name and address and whether you support or oppose the item. We are not able to display the timer as I stated in the last case, so Sean will let you know. You have two minutes to speak. Sean will let you know when you have 30 seconds and... Um, we'll also let you know when your time is up, and we appreciate everybody staying within the two-minute time frame. And so while we wait for callers to get into the queue, let's ask Lisa if we got any emails on this item. Lisa? Hi, Chairman. We received one email communication in regard to this item. Uh, since that time, the item has been deferred several times to allow um, the applicant and the um, representative of the um, of the existing multifamily to work out to come to some agreements, and there's going to be a note added to the plan that has appeased both parties. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sean, do we have any callers in the queue at this time? Chair, we do not currently have any callers in the queue, um, so we'll take a pause and then I will check back in. Thank you.
Chair, this is Sean Shepard at the call center. We do not have any callers in the queue for this item. Thank you, Sean. And so I don't think I see the council member either. I don't believe. And so is any, um, I know the developer's still on the line. So is there any other comments from the, uh, for the rebuttal, for your rebuttal, for the applicant? Anything else you want to add? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, all your time. Okay, thank you. And let's see here. I don't, I don't think I saw Councilman Taylor on the line. Uh, Lisa, I don't, I don't see Councilman on the line. No, Chairman. He, Councilman Taylor's not on the call with us. Okay. And so, seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And let's, since there's been, uh, it seems like there's been agreement on this particular issue, we'll try to, instead of recognizing all the commission members to speak, how about we try to get a, a motion? Um, Commissioner Sims, you want to make a motion? Yes, I move that we accept the staff's recommendation for this case 220112PR001. Thank you, Commissioner Sims. It's a proper motion. And is there a second? If you'll raise your icon hand or my commission. There's a second. And Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Farr. I'll second that motion. That's a proper second. Any other discussion? If you would raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to speak for discussion. Seeing none, we are ready for a roll call vote to approve. Commissioner Blackshear. I'm not voting on this one, Chairman. Oh, and Commissioner Blackshear is not voting on this item. Vice Chair Farr? Aye. Commissioner Haynes? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Lawson? Aye. Commissioner Sims? Aye. Chair votes aye, ayes have it. And then item number 23 is adopted. And so now we are ready for item number 25 presentation. And I believe, is that gonna be Abby? Abby, hi. are you? Yeah. Hey, Abby, I'm here. can hear you. Hi. Go ahead. <laughs> Great. All right, this is Abby Rickoff um, and I'll be presenting the next item, number 25, uh, this is case number 2020Z-120PR-001. Next slide. This is a request to expand the Urban Zoning Overlay District for various properties located south of Briley Parkway and north of Douglas Avenue, uh, generally along Gallatin Pike. Next slide, please. The boundary area includes approximately 1,093.4 acres. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next slide. A little bit of background on the UZO. Uh, the intent of the UZO district is to preserve and protect existing development patterns that predate the mid-1950s and portions of Nashville that were originally developed before that time and to ensure the compatibility of new development in those older portions of the city. The UZO district was originally adopted in 2000, and it was created to improve the way development in older urban areas of Nashville is regulated. The zoning code in place at that time was primarily designed for more suburban development patterns. In many cases, application of the standards to order existing urban areas of the county resulted in nonconformities or a new development that was inconsistent with the existing urban pattern. The UZO is intended to preserve and enhance urban developed areas encourage reinvestment, and also to achieve community goals for creating more walkable neighborhoods with good connectivity for vehicles, pedestrians, and transit. Next slide, please. The current application or the current request proposes um, application of the UCO to approximately 4,260 contiguous parcels in East Nashville along both sides of Gallatin Pike. The proposed expansion area is shaded in gray on the screen. 
Since its adoption in 2000, the UZO has been expanded in some areas, including last year when the UZO was applied to several hundred parcels adjacent to the proposed expansion area included within the red uh, boundary line near East Trinity Lane and Gallatin Pike. The area proposed for application of the UZO is a contiguous area adjacent to the existing UZO boundary. The majority of this area has an established development pattern of smaller lots with an interconnected street network. Next slide. The UZO is an overlay. Its application does not change the base zoning or existing entitlements on any property. In this case, the proposed overlay area encompasses property zoned for single family, two family, multifamily, and non residential uses. Some of the properties in the area are currently zoned FP or are within a PUD overlay. The effects of the UZO on those properties are limited, as the SP or PUD will continue to govern the development of those properties. Next slide, please. The standards of the UZO vary by zoning district and in the case of parking requirements by use, but generally address the placement and size of buildings and amount and location of parking. In single family and one and two family residential districts, the primary effect of the UZO is a limitation on height. For instance, whereas outside of the UZO, height in single family and one and two family zoning districts is limited to three stories. Within the UZO, a maximum height of three stories and 45 feet is specified. For multifamily and non-residential uses, the effects of the UZO are more varied and depend on the context. Generally, the UZO allows for alternative street setbacks and building height uh, subject to certain conditions, as well as uh, reductions or adjustments, adjustments in required parking. Next slide. The area proposed for application of the UZO includes properties located within numerous land use policies. The majority of the area is within the T4 urban transect. Policies in the T4 urban transect um, included in the UZO application are T4 community, uh, T4 urban community center, urban mixed use corridor, urban mixed use neighborhood, urban neighborhood evolving and urban neighborhood maintenance. There are also pockets uh, within the UZO application area that are located within the transition and conservation policy areas. Application of the UZO will help to achieve a wide range of goals identified in National Next and in the community plans for this area, including enhanced pedestrian connectivity, activation of the streetscape and centers and along corridors, and support for existing and future transit service in the area. Next slide, please. Therefore, a uh, staff recommendation is to approve. Thank you, Abby. We appreciate that. And so we are now ready to open this item for public hearing. And on this particular item, there are several council members uh, who are really the applicants or requesters uh, of this, I believe. But um, who, who, which councilman wants to take the lead on this? Is it Councilman Withers or? Uh, this, is Member, this is Councilman Withers calling. Uh, I have a couple of blocks that are in this. Really, I think the bulk of this district expansion is in District 7. And so I would submit humbly oh, okay. that the, app <laughs> that the lead Benedict? applicant is District 7 Councilmember uh, Emily Benedict. Uh, Thank, you, Council Thank you, Council Member Wood. Thank you, Chair. Sorry about that. No, hey, that's okay. I totally get it. There's, I, I know you guys don't uh, aren't, don't have responsibility for knowing every boundary line, and and certainly um, uh, uh, would be glad to jump in. Um, this is something that one of my colleagues uh, brought up. Council Member Van Reese originally said, "Let's. This is more urban. Let's take a look at doing this." And so we got with the planning department. Um, earlier this year, and this is what we have come up with based on a lot of community feedback. So um, Abby really said it a lot of um, really well for the community, but um, in regards to District 7 and, and quite frankly, all up and down Gallatin Pike, but Inglewood has grown and it's many times not been at the benefit level that the neighbors are looking for. Uh, so the additional uh, specifications in the UZO, such as triggering the sidewalk ordinance, the residential build height um, are desirable to, uh, to in this mostly residential neighborhood and district. So again, as this area has grown, the community has become more dense and, um, and, and including in the main commercial areas of this expansion. 
The WeGo number 56 bus route has the highest ridership in the city, and that is uh, the, the line that runs on Gallatin Pike. And so it just simply makes sense that we continue to develop Gallatin Pike in a way that will encourage safe walkability, a better design, and hopefully fewer cars. Um, so as many Nashvillians continue to tell us, and I know you hear it frequently, uh, they would like more control over development in order to shape the city that they want to live in. Um, as Abby said, again, in her, her great comments, uh, that is the purpose of this. So I'm grateful that we have this tool so that we can get out in front of additional development in Inglewood and help make, um, help design a better looking streetscape. As far as what's been, um, what's occurred with this, and I know my colleagues have uh, done similar efforts, uh, but because this is so widely in District 7, um, I've conducted multiple public meetings since August. Um, I've included a thorough explanation um, through that, both a document as well as um, online and uh, Mr. Wilkinson has also been a big part of that, as has Ms. Milligan. Um, but uh, I also have a thorough explanation that's been shared at least four times. I don't remember, but it could be many more uh, through my newsletter and many more times on social media, including being pinned at the top of my Facebook page and being shared through neighborhood pages as well. I've received many phone calls and emails, mostly since the, the plethora of signs went up all over this area. Thank you to the planning staff for getting those out. I know it was many of them. Uh, but I've received uh, uh, many phone calls and emails, and once I explain what the UZO does, I have received no opposition to this. So I believe this is um, uh, uh, very desirable for the neighborhood uh, as we have become more urban here, and um, this appears to have broad support. So I'd like to open the public hearing, and hope, unless my colleagues, of course, have any other comments, and um, to see what we get here on the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. And let, yeah, let's see if any of the other council members want to speak. I know that Councilor Van Rees is on the line. Councilor Van Rees. Yes. Um, thank you for recognizing me. Can you hear me? Okay. I changed my yes, uh, audio. Okay. Um, yes. I uh, wanted to give a nod to to former council member Anthony Davis. I uh, worked with him on this uh, in our, my uh, first term, his last term, and uh, appreciate uh, Council Member Benedict's. Um, uh, handling of this um, question with her neighbors. We did um, a very informative um, a virtual meeting. Uh, the uh, version uh, that, kind of the, that kind of allowed us to be able to share a lot of answers by being able to share that video. So I think that that worked out very well. Uh, the Maplewood neighbors, um, which are um, the neighborhood, if you will, uh, from the train tracks uh, to the boundary that you see here, did request um, to uh, not be included at this time because of the very short dead end streets um, that it just didn't make as much sense uh, to their community at this time as it did on the District 7 side. However, there was uh, enthusiastic uh, support along the commercial corridor uh, and uh, the areas in which um, uh, commercial uh, viability is present. Um, and so uh, that's why you kind of see that strange little um, line uh, that kind of doesn't go all the way to the train track. So um, with that uh, early request and, and uh, alteration, uh, we have uh, been able to receive uh, uh, full support uh, on the District 8 portion of this application. and. Uh, I uh, look forward to uh, hearing if there's any additional feedback. Thanks so much. Chairman, this is Director Kempf um, with planning. I just wanted to confirm we, we can't hear you. If you're, I saw your mic moving, um, I wanted to- Can you hear me now? Sure. Yes, I can. Sorry, I don't know what happened. I'm having, I'm having technical difficulties, <laughs> sorry. Um, let's see if uh, I think Councilman Parker is still on the line. Councilman Parker, you wanna say anything else?
He's can't. Chair, um, thank you, you for are. recognizing me. Um, I, uh, I I would just concur with my colleagues' comments um, and appreciate their uh, leadership on this one. So that's all I've got for now. Thank you. Okay, excellent. And so now um, I appreciate all the council members. Uh, I, I know a lot of hard work goes in, into these, so I want to say thank you to them. So we're ready um, to take calls from the members of the public now uh, who wish to call in. So your screen should show the call in number. And so um, please call in now. You don't have to wait as we put you into a queue. Um, and when you begin your testimony, as a reminder, please state your name and address and whether you support or oppose the item. We're not able to display the timer, and so you have two minutes to speak, and Sean will let you know when you have 30 seconds left, and then we'll let you know when the two minutes is, is ended. Um, we appreciate everybody calling in. Um, and so while we wait on callers to get into the queue, let's ask Lisa if we've received any emails on this item. Hi, Chairman. This is Lisa. Uh, we did not receive any emails. We set up as part of our uh, public outreach a hotline number with a detailed message that people could call. Uh, we did receive several voicemails that were returned where people had questions regarding the um, the application of the UZO, but we did not receive any um, any direct emails to the Planning Commission. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Sean, do we have any callers on the line right now? Chair, this is Sean in the call center. We do not currently have any callers, so we'll take a pause in case anyone is trying to reach us, and then I'll check back in. Excellent. Thank you. Chair, this is Sean Shepard in the call center. We do not have any callers in the queue for this item. Thank you. And so, um, Councilor Benedict, do you want to add anything, any last comments? And then we'll close the public hearing. Thank you, Chair. I just, I would say that um, I think the um, illustration that there's not callers means that there uh, is broad understanding and support in the community as expected. So I um, would respectfully ask the um, commission to approve. Thank you. Thank you. And so seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And so we'll open this up for discussion um, from the, co the commissioners. Um, and we'll try this again if uh, I, I want to make sure every commissioner has a chance to speak if they want. but. Um, let's try to get a motion and then we'll see if there's any other discussion. Commissioner Haynes, do you want to make a motion? I move approval of staff's recommendation. That's a proper motion. And is there a second? If you'll read Commissioner. Uh, this is Commissioner, Commissioner Well, I was going to say this Commissioner Blackshear. I'll second. Oh, thank you, Commissioner Blackshear. Thank you very much. And I appreciate it. It's hard to see everybody on the on the app, so I appreciate that. So that's proper second. Any discussion from the commissioners, if you'll raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to speak. And give you all enough time. And seeing none, we are ready for a roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Ayes have it, and this item is adopted. We're now on to item 26. And I think Patrick is going to present. Good 
evening, Chair. This is Patrick Napier. Just wanted to do an audio check before we get started. Good evening. We can hear you. Go ahead. All right. This is Patrick Napier presenting item 26-2020-Z-125-PR-001 on behalf of Metro Planning Land Development. Next slide, please. This is a request to change the zoning from CS, CL, CN, MUL, MUN, R8, OR20, and R6, and RM20 to MULA, MUNA, OR20A, and RM20A. Slide. Staff's recommendation is to approve. Slide. The five points redevelopment plan is intended to create an environment conducive to the development and improvement of a neighborhood commercial center and neighborhood commercial corners and the stabilization of residential neighborhoods in the five points project area to benefit all residents. The boundary map on the screen illustrates the intent for the general land use within the five points neighborhood as established by the redevelopment plan. The redevelopment plan contains design guidelines for redevelopment and requires MDHA approval for proposed projects. The redevelopment plan is set to expire by the end of the calendar year. Slide. This slide shows the redevelopment district boundaries for both the East Bank Redevelopment District and the Five Points Redevelopment District. Um, this, the reason require, uh, request contains uh, portions of these and so we do have some overlap. So on the left, you can see parcels outlined in red. Those lie within the East Bank. And on the right, you can see where that uh, conversely has uh, is not shown in the five points redevelopment, but the same area is outlined in red. The request is to change the zoning for these parcels from CS Commercial Service to MULA. Slide. The intent of this reason request is to place seven districts with similar standards of the redevelopment district onto parcels located within the expiring district. The new zoning districts are reflective of the general goals and intent of the redevelopment district. The alternative zone districts will create an urban form that activates the public realm through improved building placement, bulk design, and parking standards. As proposed, the requested zone districts are consistent with the land use policies for all the respect, respective parcel locations. Additionally, some of the zone districts are inconsistent with the current land use, po land use policies and rezoning will bring them closer to consistency. All of the parcels within the rezone request are located within the urban zoning overlay. Slide. This area contains historic zoning overlays. The peach color identifies the East Bank Redevelopment District. The purple represents the Five Points Redevelopment District. The yellow outline identifies the Edgefield Historic Preservation District. The blue outline represents the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Overlay. Slide. The next series of slides will show a comparison between the proposed and requested zoning district, along with the uh, policies for each respective district. Um, first, we have CL to MULA within the T4 Mixed Use Corridor. The parcels are outlined in blue. You can see the bulk change between the two zone districts within the table. Slide. Next is CS to MULA within the T4 mixed use corridor policy. The parcels are outlined in red. You can see the change in the table um, between CS and MULA. I would also note that the parcels located on Woodland Avenue, which are currently zoned CS, would qualify for adaptive residential use. The adaptive residential use would allow for more floor area than the requested MULA zone district. Slide. This is a comparison for the R8 zone district to be rezoned to MULA within the T4 Urban Neighborhood Center. Uh, the parcels are outlined in green. The table highlights the change um, in the entitlements. Um, slide. This slide shows the requested change from MUL to MULA within the T4 Neighborhood Center. Again, the chart will show the difference between the entitlements for these parcels. Slide. This slide shows the requested change of CN to MULA within the T4 Neighborhood Center. Uh, the parcels are outlined in yellow, and you can see the change in the entitlements and the table associated. 
slide. Lastly, this is a re, this rezone for this portion is from C into MU and A within the T4 Urban Neighborhood Center. The parcels are outlined in the yellow hatch. You can see the difference in the requested entitlements on the chart. Slide, please. Here you can see the associated land use policies for the requested rezone. All the requested zone districts, again, are consistent with the five points redevelopment plan guidance. And just to reiterate, the intent of the rezone is to convert the existing zone districts to those that will be that will be supported by the underlying land use policy when the redevelopment plan expires. Next slide. In conclusion, staff's recommendation is to approve as the request is consistent with the underlying land use policies. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate that. And so now we'll open this item for public hearing. Um, and the applicant uh, in this is is the Councilman Withers. And so, um, Councilman Withers. Yeah, Chair uh, Chair Atkins, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much, Chairman Atkins. I appreciate the attention of uh, the commissioners. I really want to, uh, in advance, uh, praise our staff <laughs> from uh, the planning department. Uh, the initial request that I had to them was to say that let's look at this redevelopment district and convert it into an urban design overlay. And they said, you know, Councilman, let's look at the base zoning districts that are available today that weren't available 30 years ago and see what we can do. And I, I've worked diligently at that uh, with staff from planning, the codes department, public works, um, uh, Metro Historic Zoning. I've had many, many uh, roundtable discussions with staff from all these departments. Everyone has been so focused on trying to recreate the the will of the community as expressed in these documents over 30 years now everyone has been focused on the the neighborhood aspect of trying to preserve and protect our neighborhoods and i just appreciate everyone's uh, ability to do that i i sent a letter uh which is posted to the website it's lengthy but it goes through kind of the history of that but i'll run through that quickly but um, it says, you know, commissioners, thank you for your service to our county. I appreciate the staff recommendation for approval of five points rezoning plan that is pr primarily des designed to continue the work of the MDJ redevelopment, five points redevelopment design guidelines district and lane use plan. Once that uh, plan expires on December 31st of this year, I request your recommendation of approval uh, and we'll provide some background. The East Nashville Neighborhood Groups and Metro Council representatives began working with MDHA in the mid-1980s to remove blight and to create a viable and vibrant business district in the Five Points area where none had not existed previously. In 1985, the Lachlan Springs East End Conservation Zoning Overlay District was enacted as what I believe was the first conservation overlay in Nashville which was meant to provide a less restrictive historic preser preservation tool than the H Edgefield Historic Pres Preservation Zoning District, which had been enacted in about 1979. When the initial Lachlan Springs East End Conservation o Overlay District was enacted in 18 1985, it did not include the, the heart of Five Points proper, anything on 10th Street or anything south of Fatherland facing properties. When the MDHA Five Points Area Plan was converted in 1990 to the Redevelopment District, the boundaries are drawn in such a manner as to capture that central Five Points intersection area that was left out of the conservation overlay, and also to extend eastward into Lockdown Springs to include commercial corner pockets such as at 17th and Fatherland, 16th and Woodland, and 16th and Ford Lake. A main purpose for the Redevelopment District boundaries being drawn that way was to enable the removal of blight through acquisition or eminent domain, as well as to prevent adverse uses such as pawn shops, liquor stores, and used car lots through land use restrictions placed over these commercial corners parcels. The redevelopment district tool was in place, sometimes but not always overlock 
overlapping with the conservation overlay when the 1998 tornado struck. A RUDAP process followed in 1999, convened by the American Institute of Architects. The RUDAP identified a specific community goal of creating a viable business district at the interior neighborhood commercial corners, as well as particularly in the Five Points intersection itself. In 2000, work began on the MDHA Five Points Redevelopment District Design Guidelines document and separate land use plan. That redevelopment uh, district guidelines uh, series of documents are available online at MDHA's website. They outline uh, the, a redevelopment district design guidelines document that superseded the circa 1974 Bay Sony districts and called for buildings that were built to the sidewalk, that were multi-story, that had minimum first floor heights, that had commercial on the ground floor with re residential above, with parking on the side at best, if not in the alleys uh, as the primary access point. The, the rezoning districts that I'm proposing today match identically those design guideline criteria that are expiring on December 31st of this year. In some cases, the, the, the redevelopment district design guidelines called for building heights that were taller than the base zoning allowed. And this is a really important point to consider. The design guidelines that were promoted by thousands of community members as well as architects 20 years ago called for buildings that were taller and more dense and more intense than the CS base zoning districts allowed. The land use plan also superseded the base zoning districts by restricting uses such as liquor stores and used car sales. And so with, the, with that district expiring and with the proposed base districts, base zoning districts that were uh, proposing in this redevelopment district, these base zoning districts also, once the redevelopment district expires, will continue that neighborhood focused tradition of limiting car uses and restricting uses such as liquor stores. In 2003, the Lachlan Springs East End Conservation Overlay was expanded that included all the areas south of Fatherland between 10th and 14th, all the way up 10th and the heart of uh, and the heart of the Five Points intersection itself. This meant that since 2003, the prime area that we identify as Five Points today has been included in the Lachlan Springs East End Conservation Overlay District. Um, since that time, the land use plan was a re, uh, revisited in 2014 and 2015 through a public process that included public meetings between MDHA, planning, and uh, other metro departments. And that readoption of the land use plan went through the Metro Council through Council Bill 2014-948. And that plan allowed commercial and mixed uses on some parcels that otherwise had uh, R8 or R6 zoning districts. And this is a really important point. Those owners of those properties have operated under an assumption from the redevelopment district that they would have commercial or mixed use opportunities for their parcels, despite the base zoning under the cover of the redevelopment district, which is about to expire. So what I would like to do briefly is to go over the parcels. There are some parcels that are uh, under this rezoning plan uh, promoted to have OR20 zoning, and all of these are OR20 zoning, and the OR20 zoning is, is purported to be in place in locations in which the underlying Nashville Next community plan is not T4 Neighborhood Center, but they're all OR20. So these are 1104 Ordway Place. 1104 Ordway Place is adjacent to the Gallatin Avenue MUGA zoning district. It already has OR20 base zoning district. The moving to the OR20A preserves the office use entitlements that are already being exercised there while bringing the base zoning district more into compliance with the community character manual. For 1105 Gallatin, same as above. 
these are parcels that already have their houses that have offices uses in them under the cover of OR20 zoning existing and under the cover of having uh, mixed uses permitted by the redevelopment district, which is expiring and we're hoping to extend by moving them to OR20A in compliance with the redevelopment district. 1103 and 1105 Holly, same thing. They're adjacent to MUL zoning currently. They have OR20 zoning currently. They are seeking to retain their OR20 uh, entitlements and they requested to move them to OR20A so that again, everyone is on the same page from Metro departments and reviewing permits on those properties at 1103 and 1105 Holly, where they already have OR20, we wanted to move them to OR20A, which at least is a compromised position that limits them to OR20A, but is in compliance with the community character manual, at least mostly. The next one is Zero Fatherland Street. This is a parcel that is adjacent and connected to the former Bill Martin's former uh, grocery store. This has been used for a long time as the a gravel parking lot and loading dock for the Bill Martin's grocery store. It's had R6 zoning for a long time. No one has ever proposed to build a house on it, which is pretty uh, uh, striking in East Nashville. Um, this proposal to move it to OR20A allows it to retain some of the uses that were promoted under the redevelopment district land use plan, but it limits it to OR20A and specifically the use that is requested is for a parking lot. It is requested for a parking lot to support the adaptive reuse of the former grocery store. I've actually held a community meeting with the adjacent residential neighbors and they are generally in, uh, in agreement with the, the plan to move this vacant gravel lot park parcel that, that connects to a, a loading dock to a grocery store. The neighbors are generally in agreement with moving that to an OR20 uh, zoning in order to allow that to be off street parking, which they support. We have had discussions about uh, what, the, um, what the landscape buffer should look like as well as lighting. We've had a lot of uh, very descriptive <laughs> and prescriptive and proscriptive discussions about that. But the, general, the neighbors are generally supportive of moving that to an OR20A to allow that property owner to exercise some of the uses that were allowed under the redevelopment district, but to limit those to a parking lot with some conditions such as landscape buffering and lighting and signage. Um, and I would request the commission's approval of that. Next, we have 1101 and 1103 uh, Shelby, which, uh, again, already have OR20 zoning. It's, this is just moving them to OR20A to move them more into compliance with the community character manual. Um, it allows them to continue to have their potential for office uses. I, I don't know if any of them are using it currently, but it just allows us not to remove those uses from those property owners at 1101 and 1103 uh, Shelby Avenue, um, but to place restrictions on them, which are in compliance with community character manual. So overall, I believe that this, um, because the National Next uh, District was updated in 2014-2015, I cannot speak to as to why the community plan itself was not updated in 2014-2014 simultaneously to mirror the land use plan update for the redevelopment district. I, I, I mean, I can't speak to that, but I think that this proposal that I'm bringing forward to the commission is fair to the property owners. It allows them some degree of usage of the land use rights they had under the redevelopment district so that those don't expire on December 31st. However, in every single case, it limits those to OR20A, which is more consistent with the the Nashville Next Community Plan. And the real benefit I think of this is that had the community character, the community plan been updated to allow, a T, to extend the T4 Center community plan further into the interior of the neighborhood, someone could come back at a future date and request a more intense commercial zoning. I think the real compromise solution, which I would encourage the board to 
support is that under this circumstance, under this, these unique circumstances, these property owners operated under a rational conclusion that the redevelopment district allowed them some degree of commercial uses. And in most cases for these six parcels, they already had base zoning that allowed them some degree of commercial uses. This, what this does is this does not take anything away from those commercial uses. It allows them to keep what they have, but to limit them from future further intense uses. If these property owners want to come back at a future time for more intense uses or more building volumes, they would need to come back to the, the neighborhood associations and the future council member for a community plan amendment, a major community plan amendment, and a zone change. So I think that is that offers some degree of protection for the property owners as well as for the neighborhood groups to prevent further commercial encroachment. I will next step to the 10th Street side of this proposal. On the west side of 10th, that area ha was included when Nashville Next was adopted in 2014 and 2015. That area, the community plan was for T4 Neighborhood Center. And so we have some parcels where the site, existing site conditions uh, don't necessarily match up with what the base zoning is. So one of those, I believe the address is 110 South 10th Street. It's at the corner of 10th and Russell. It is, um, it is a parcel, it's a 10th Street facing parcel it is owned by Park Center, which is an affordable housing and wraparound services community provider. Um, when it was down zoned to R8, that sort of ignored the fact that there was already an eight unit multifamily complex spanning this parcel facing 10. The proposed, uh, uh, the proposed RM uh, 20A, what that RM 20A does on that parcel is it alleviates a non-conforming use and allows that park center, which is a great neighbor, it allows them, it re relieves them from some hindrances that they might have if they ever wanted to expand their units. However, what it does do is say that the R8 doesn't make sense there for a total of maybe four units. They have eight already that are grandfathered. It allows them to operate within the eight units that they currently have, they can't expand it beyond that, but allows them to expand those units, add on to them if they need to without undue hindrances, although they are still within the edge built historic preservation zoning district. So they would still have to go through that. Um, similarly, at uh, 210 South 10th Street, this is a church parcel that was consolidated from amongst a number of 10th Street facing parcels in 1964. In 1964, that church parcel was consolidated. It actually eliminated an alley that was existing at that time, but these were all 10th Street facing parcels. That parcel assemblage remains within a T4 neighborhood center policy, which allows mixed uses, obviously. And so for that, the, um, the church trustees who are at this stage since 1964 are quite elderly, had been interested in selling that property. Um, and I had a community meeting about that a little while back. The proposals were to have uh, office condominiums, which are small in space, as well as some residential units. There was some discussion about how those would be al aligned along the block faces. But uh, we, we did have a community meeting about that. Some neighbors, again, were a little bit vocal about that, but I did take some uh, I did accept community comment cards about it. Many neighbors in the Edgeville neighborhood were generally supportive of the plan. What their concern tended to be was about where the driveway access would be for the parking lot, which currently exists, by the way. Um, but the comments were not so much concern from the Edgeville neighborhood were not so much about the use as they were about where the driveway access points would be. And of course, those would be um, decided by Public Works under the guidance of the MUNA um, zoning that is proposed. Uh, uh, again, the MUNA that is proposed for 210 South 10th is for the smaller level of office uses, smaller level of restaurant uses. It prohibits fast food restaurants entirely, 
And and I believe that that is a good transition from the NULA that is in the five points proper area. This parcel is absolutely the, the edge of the T4 neighborhood center policy area. I believe that the MUNA is a good transition between that more intense use and the residential neighborhood in the interior of Edgefield and uh, the uses that are allowed under MUNA generally are not ones that conflicted with the community comments from the comment cards that are received from community meeting that are received. So we would still have a, a little bit of a discussion with public works about driveway and access points. However, the, uh, this MUNA zoning would allow adaptive reuse of the church structure itself, which of course is always a good thing. I always want to see an adaptive reuse when I can. However, if the property owners decided to demolish that structure, that structure would have to be built up to 10th Street. It would have to meet the MUNA standards of not exceeding a 0 0.6 floor area ratio, which would tend to pull that building toward 10th and away from the residential neighborhood. And they would still have to meet parking requirements as per Metro code. And it would limit some of those uses to the less intense uses, which would be an appropriate buffer, I believe, into the residential neighborhood uh, further west into Edgefield. And with that, I will um, cease my comments for now and reserve the rest of my time to answer any questions that the commissioners have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman, for that thorough explanation on a very complex issue. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, and so now uh, we are ready. And, and Councilman, uh, what we'll do is we'll take calls from the public and then obviously reserve time for uh, your rebuttal or any additional comments that you'd like to make. And so now we are ready to take calls from the members of the public who wish to call in. Your screen should show um, the call in number. Please call in now. Um, this is the last item that we're hearing for a public hearing. Um, and it's going to be in a queue, so you don't have to wait till everyone speaks to call in and just call in immediately. Um, as a reminder, when you begin your testimony, please state your name and address. And whether you support or oppose the item, we're not able to display the timer visually. So Sean will let you know. You have two minutes to speak. Uh, Sean will let you know when uh, there's 30 seconds left of your testimony and then when your time has ran out. Um, so while we wait on folks to call in, Lisa, did we get any emails on this particular item? Hi, Chairman. We re did receive emails in regards to this item. Um, we have a, a deadline that we have established to be able to get comments to you all in a timely manner. Prior to that deadline, we received emails from five people in support and five people in opposition. Uh, following the deadline, we received three emails in support and three emails of general questions. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Now we're ready to take uh, callers. Sean, do we have any callers on this item? Chair, this is Sean Shepard at the call center. We do have callers, so we'll work on getting the first one placed into the meeting uh, momentarily. Okay, Thank you. And Chair, you have the first caller. Okay, welcome. Um, please state your name and your address, and you may begin. Thank you, my Mr. Chairman Logan Key, and I'm at 1411 Fatherland Street uh, in East Nashville. Uh, I'm in opposition uh, to the proposal uh, as presented because it needs more uh, neighborhood feedback incorporated into it. As you heard from Councilman Withers, uh, he's worked very closely with council, uh, countless uh, metro departments, but he has, uh, in my opinion, not sufficiently accounted for the neighborhood interests uh, that have a stake in uh, in this situation. And I described public comments, uh, page 3940 of the November 10th comment, uh, some of my concerns. If you read the record carefully, uh, you see vocal support from individuals connected to the development community, but not vocal support from the neighborhood community. I want to give you one example, uh, Mr. Chairman. As you know, 
Central Council recently passed Bill 2019-111, create zoning options, include vacation rentals from uh, mixed-use OR and commercial. We've got a pace, uh, case pending now in District 19 that addresses this type of thing in Germantown. In Lachlan Springs, where I live, uh, we've got several of the old neighborhood commercial corners. Many of those have been around for years, and under both the UDHA plan and the community plan, uh, they're designed to serve the needs of the, of the local community people who live around here. On my block, for instance, we've got a little 7-Eleven, snacks, sodas, beer, and so forth, and it's frequented by lots of folks who live here. Elsewhere in the neighborhood, you've got bakery, a deli, a coffee shop, pizza place, and a few restaurants. These are all walkable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but with the significant floor area ratios uh, allowing the mixed use, unless you attach the dash DNS to the zoning, uh, we really risk vacation rental, uh, uh, assuming a number of these commercial corners that I think the neighbors really want to protect. I raised that issue with Councilman Withers. He rejected it, uh, even at the point of claiming that the Five Points Redevelopment District supports vacation, which it doesn't, uh, and neither does Nashville Next. In fact, the old redevelopment plan that I Caller, your time has expired. Please finish your comment. It actually discourages semi transient residential use. And so I encourage you to have that conversation about the uh, short term rental issue as you, uh, as you have uh, deliberations about this. And thank you. Thank you, sir. Next caller. John. Chair, you have the next caller. Welcome, and please state your name and address, and you have two minutes to speak, and you may begin. My name is James D'Amato. I've lived at 800 Basketball Street in Edgefield for 15 years. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Edgefield Neighbors Association as a board member, and as such, I'm requesting the courtesy of a of five minutes, um, if that's possible. Um, yes, it is. If, if you're the only speaker for the neighborhood, is that? Yes. Are you, yes. So, uh, okay, you can have five minutes. Um, I'm requesting what's the um, speaking regarding the preservation and quality of life issues for Edgefield residents. The neighborhood board approves of the plan overall. However, there's some points that we'd like to see revised. Historic Edgefield Neighbors understands that the objective of this rezoning plan is to bring consistency to existing commercial properties in the Five Points area, and we recognize that the plan is critical um, and that existing commercial base zoning is inappropriate for the area. We're extremely grateful for Council Member Withers' um, considerable efforts, as well as the efforts of planning and other metro departments. The plan was, however, developed by the councilman in cooperation with planning and metro departments. And we were presented with the end product. And I've struggled in the past weeks to translate into layman's terms and to negotiate for alternatives that differ from elements in the rezoning plan. We're concerned about zoning intensity and the unintended impact on the residential adjacent properties, particularly on the 800 and 900 blocks of Woodland Street where its south side is adjacent to Russell Street residences in Edgefield. There have been recent developments in Wood on Old Woodland Street that have had adverse effects on Russell Street's traffic and parking issues. Um, first, we'd like to note that the 800 block of Woodland Street is in, as Patrick has noted, um, it's in the active East Bank Redevelopment District um, within a residential sub-district we believe has very different guidelines than the mixed limited um, zoning class that's proposed. And we'd like to suggest that office residential would be more in line with the Edgefield preservation overlay and the residential sub-district of the East Bank Redevelopment District. Um, we're also concerned with a very long 900 block of Woodland Street on its south side um, where it is adjacent to Russell Street residential property. Uh, we'd like to avoid unintentionally overburdening 
Russell Street, shared alley, and residential parking. If there's any flexibility, we'd like to see if a less intense class, such as mixed use neighborhood, um, could be used on that side of the street as a transition from residential to the full and commercial on Main. Um, again, to avoid overburdening the alley um, and residential parking and inappropriate uses that might be available under mixed use limited. Um, Patrick had noted that um, the Five Points Redevelopment District was designed around residential and neighborhood uses. Um, to that end, we'd like to explore whether the NS versions of mixed use classes could be explored on Woodland Street. Um, as it is a intended residential district, not a tourist district. Um, I also have an open question regarding buffer on the mixed use properties that would occur on Woodland Street on the south side, um, alley adjacent to residential properties in Russell Street. Patrick may have touched on them, but I missed the point um, that was, as he was discussing the 900 block of um, Woodland Street. It is, however, an area that's not directly protected by the Edgefield Preservation Overlay. Um, nonetheless, it's something that the Edgefield Board would hope would be resolved before we commit to this rezoning plan. Um, I thank you for indulging for such a detailed statement. Overall, the Historic Appeals Neighbors Board is in support of Councilman Wither's five point rezoning plan. We ask, however, that you take some time to consider potential for overdeveloping Woodland Street, potentially damaging a residential neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next caller, Sean. Chair, you have the next call. Thank you, and welcome to the call. You have two minutes. Please say your name and address, and you may begin. Hello, my name is Kelly Collier, and I live at 208 South 10th Street. I'm calling on behalf of the HOA uh, at, at Homes at 10th and Russell. As presented, there is not clear consensus within our HOA on the proposal, specifically the change in zoning for 210 South 10th Street from R8 to MUNA. The key concerns align with the following issues. On the broader plan and the specific permitted uses uh, under MUNA, the HOA did not support the use of bar, beer, and cigarette retail. What's permitted, alternatively, we view these uses would be better reserved for more commercial zoning. The we feel the plan would benefit from guidelines on that improve sustainability, including bike paths, electric vehicle charging, and preserving green space. In terms of the bulk standards for MUN and MUNA, we feel that they should include max density guidelines for residential development, um, that they should include and maintain minimum size setbacks from retail and office development adjacent to residential property including those specific to businesses open after hours. We feel the plan should include clear guidelines for separation of commercial property from adjacent residential property and contain clear guidelines prohibiting the use of alleys adjacent to residential property as the primary access to parking spaces. We feel the plan should provide clarity on the number of access points required directly from- oh, you have 30 seconds versus reliance on alleys and maintain the building height of three stories and a maximum of 45 feet. We don't feel that the plan should allow uh, permit for so use as a paid parking lot without addressing some of the traffic and access conditions mentioned. We appreciate the opportunity to provide feedback. We appreciate the effort and vision that was incorporated into the plan and broadly agree with its strategic direction, but hope these issues will be taken into account before zoning changes particularly to the 210 South 10th Street property. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Chair, we don't currently have any other callers in the queue, so we'll take a, a short pause and then I'll check back in. 
Thank you. Chair, this is Sean Shepard in the call center. We do not have any other callers in the queue for this item at this time. Thank you, Sean. And so now we are ready uh, for the council member. Uh, any additional comments for rebuttal? Council uh, thank you so much, Chair Atkins. Um, again, I, I would refer everyone. I have a very detailed letter that I posted. It's nearly five pages. I know it's a lot of information, but it gives a lot of history and how um, people made the best decisions that they could at that time. Uh, and I am trying to make the best decisions that I can at this time uh, in terms of matching up the lane use based zoning districts that we have today with what the redevelopment district documents that the community has advocated for for 20 more years, how we match that up with the, the tools that we have today. Um, in terms of Mr. Logan Key, I certainly appreciate his comments. I know he worked extensively on Bill 2 uh, uh, on some of the short-term rental bills. I, I totally agree with that. In terms of the NS versions of bills, um, I have stated from the outset I'm not interested in downzoning anyone's property. And so if there are if there's a particular property that we are moving up to a mixed-use district such as one of the ones that's proposed i would be con i would be amenable to considering an up zoning when 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 we're moving that to the new district with the ns if we're moving it from a district that doesn't that does include i mean but that that's just kind of what i'm trying to get at if we have a district that currently doesn't allow short-term non-owner record short-term rentals and we're wanting to move it to one that does those are cases in which I would be amenable to considering an NS district. But so far, the only district that I've seen where even that would be possibly considered is 210 South 10. And if Mr. Logan Key would like to speak with the property owners at 210 South 10, I'd be happy to continue that conversation because that, that could be a, a good compromise. But it's the only case in which I really feel like that is appropriate because for properties that have MUL, they can open a hotel anyway. I don't know why they would do short-term rentals. The redevelopment district itself actually, ironically, in some ways promotes short-term rentals, um, which is a reason why I'm wanting to expire that. Um, in terms of Mr. D'Amato's comments, um, the areas along Woodland Street in the eight and 900 blocks are, uh, in the East Bank and the Five Points Redevelopment District, they are promoted as having three to four story buildings that are mixed use. Obviously, in 20 years ago, no one thought about short term rentals. But, um, like, again, if Mr. D'Amato and the Edgefield neighbors want to talk about short term rentals with those particular property owners, I'd be willing to have it to have that conversation at the Metro Council level. But I think that from the Planning Commission level, the question is, you know, the question is, do you want to revert to the CS or CL zoning that the community wanted to, to subvert 20 years ago? Do you want to let that reemerge or do you want to move it to the new zoning districts that match the uh, design guidelines documents from the redevelopment districts that the community wanted, which says that we want buildings of three to four stories with mixed uses that's 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 what this base zoning change does is it's, it's an, almost a literal translation in that area saying that the the redevelopment district called for buildings of three to four stories on woodland street in those areas specifically 
and that those buildings would have mixed uses. And in my detailed letter, which is five pages that I submitted to the commissioners, I talked about how this Woodland Street location is downhill from Russell Street. So for the Edgefield neighbors, even if they built a three-story building or even a four-story building, how that would compare to the height that, that these neighbors are able to have on Russell Street within their existing zoning entitlements, even within the Edgefield Historic Zoning uh, uh, Historic Protection Zoning District. Um, in terms of Ms. Collier, what I would suggest to Ms. Collier is that, you know, I was uh, a candidate for Metro Council at that time, but I remember how the discussions went when, when the condos and the SP was proposed at 10th and Russell that included the townhomes in which Ms. Collier lives. The Edgefield neighbors, neighbors at that time were irate and came to the Planning Commission were very um, opposed at that time to building the buildings that Ms. Collier lives in. Um, and so, you know, I, I understand the concern about adding a, a, a block face south of, of that. But, you know, again, it's like when when the buildings that were proposed that were in the, the complex that Ms. Collier lives in, um, when those were proposed, the neighbors in Edgefield opposed that. And, and yet they were built, they were approved by the Planning Commission and the Council, and they meet, they're about three stories tall, and those meet the overall design guidelines of the Edgefield Historic Preservation Zoning District for the property at 210 South 10th Street. Again, I had a community meeting about it. Some people were vocal that they didn't want any commercial on Fatherland Street. Of course, naturally, there is commercial on Fatherland Street. There has been commercial on Fatherland Street for more than 100 years including at 7th and Fatherland, including at 10th and Fatherland, including at 11th and Fatherland, 14th and Fatherland, and 17th and Fatherland. For more than 100 years, there has been commercial at these commercial corners on Fatherland. So I get it that neighbors on Fatherland may not want it, but nevertheless, the historic pattern of development on Fatherland Street has been, there has been commercial uh, existent and approved on those corners on Fatherland Street for 100 years years before any of these present residents were born. That's just the reality. That's documented historical evidence, right? And when those historic commercial buildings were constructed 100 years ago, before the 1916 fire, they were built without parking lots, right? And so at 210 South 10th Street, it, that property currently actually has a parking lot. And the debate amongst the neighbors is whether or not that existing parking lot for a church building that has a seating capacity of 200 should continue to have a parking lot access onto Fatherland Street, which it already has. And so again, like I understand that neighbors don't want people driving up and down the street in their urban grid neighborhood, which they, they purchased their house on. But again, most of these neighbors purchased their houses on a street, on Fatherland Street, and they have alley access. And alley access means that they have garage access off the alley. And many of these neighbors who have written in actually have the capacity, if they don't already have a two-car garage built off the alley, if they don't currently have parking access off of the alley, they have easy access to construct a garage or a parking lot off of the alley, which is the way that urban neighborhoods are designed historically. So for all those invoking historic descriptions, historic neighborhoods were built with parking access off of the alley, which they have. And so I understand the concern that they may have that People may drive down their street, a uh, Fatherland Street, which used to have a streetcar down it, or they may be concerned people may drive down Fatherland Street, which the reason they drive down Fatherland is because the neighborhoods have blocked off Russell and Basketball, which leaves the only available street as Fatherland, right? All of these actions are the result of their own neighborhood's actions. So, yes, people can drive down Fatherland Street and they can park on Fatherland Street, except for the 700 block of Fatherland Street, where these very neighbors decided to invoke 
residential permit parking to stop people from supporting a local small business, which is Sky Blue Cafe, right? But but that's that's kind of where we're at, is that people in some of these neighborhoods simply do not want people walking, driving, or parking on public streets or sidewalks. And like, I, I, I sympathize with them, I empathize with them, but there are other neighborhoods even in East Nashville, that could support their suburban lifestyle expectations better than the the location where they decided to purchase their home. And what better than where they decided not only to purchase their home, but to promote the very East Bank and Five Points redevelopment districts that explicitly promoted the creation of a Five Points redevelopment district that calls for intense mixed uses along Woodland and in the Five Points Development District, including on both sides of tents. These very neighbors, in some cases, promoted or participated in these plans that called for intense, intense redevelopment and mixed use along these very corridors that they are now complaining about. And I empathize with that as much as I can. But however, for my folks on Russell, what I have to say to them is that the vast majority of them already have off-street parking. They already have off-street parking. And I worked with them a year ago to create a uh, plan to implement for them residential permit parking on the eight and 900 blocks of Russell Street. So not only do most of them have off-street parking, off of the alley, they also have residential permit parking and so like as much as i empathize with that like i have to look at the facts of the case of the way that this has developed and these very neighbors themselves have promoted redevelopment districts that called for buildings of intense mixed uses along woodland street along this particular portion of woodland street that are up to three to four stories tall with parking in the rear along the alley. And if they don't like it today, I'm so sorry for them, but this is a result of the very actions uh, that they themselves have participated in for 20 or 30 or 35 years. And so this rezoning plan matches as closely as possible the documents that this very community, hundreds, and sometimes thousands of members of our community have participated in for 20 or 30 or 35 years. And I can't throw that out because a handful of people decided that they don't want anyone driving or parking on the street. I can't do that. So I asked the commissioners to look at this and to look at this and to find, just as the staff did, that this meets, if it doesn't meet 100%, the planning, the, the Nashville Next plan, I mean, it's the overall plan, and certainly for the property owners that are in a position where their where they're OR20 entitlements maybe don't meet the, the T4 Neighborhood Center plan, that, yeah, it meets what this community has promoted through these redevelopment districts that promoted redevelopment, that promoted mixed uses on those same exact parcels. And for us to try to take that away from those property owners, th that would be bad. But the good point about it is that this allows those property owners to retain what we all think they need. Like if they bought a house that had office use entitlements, they can continue to have the office use entitlements. But that's it. Right? I think that's fair to the property owners and to the neighbors. And so for the neighbors, if we had adjusted the community plan, they could come back later and ask for MUNA or MULA or maybe even MUGA. But no, this limits it to OR20A. That's it. All of the parcels in question from a community plan standpoint are OR20A. And they're all based on either they already had OR20A before the redevelopment district started or the redevelopment district allowed a lot of allowed them even more mixed uses than that. This is a good compromise that protects the property owners and it protects 
the neighborhoods because the moment someone was to come back later and want something that's not allowed in OR 20A on those parcels that we're talking about, then they have to come all the way through a major community plan change and a zone change. And that gives the neighborhoods a huge amount of leverage. And I think that's appropriate. So that settles the question of any commercial encroachment into the interior of the neighborhoods. And for people who bought a house that backs up to Woodland Street, my, especially in Edgeville, my advice to them was like, you need to fire your realtor because you didn't do your real, your research and neither did your realtor because, because in 20, in the 2006 community plan, East Nashville community plan update, Woodland was a major corridor and you knew that in 2014, 2015, when the East National Community Plan was updated, that was a collector street. It was a tier one center. The, the, the boat redevelopment district called for that to be a major area of, re, of intense mixed use development that called for three to four story buildings. That was publicly available information. And if you purchased a house that backed up to that and you expected to have a house behind you, I'm so sorry that you did not purchase a house based on publicly available information and make a rational decision because you didn't. What you purchased was a house that backed up to a major collector street and a tier one center that the East Bank and Five Points Redevelopment Districts called for buildings of three to four stories of intense mixed uses on those parcels. And so that's been publicly available for 20 years. And so if you purchased a house that backs up to that in the last 20 years, that's been publicly available information. And if you purchased a house before 20 years, you were a participant or had an opportunity to participate in those community planning documents that were also publicly processed. <laughs> so like, there's just no excuse for people who back, purchased a property on the north side of Russell. Almost every property on Russell has off-street parking ex or the capacity to build off-street parking. Almost every single parcel. And I can take that to the Metro Council. So again, like folks who, purchased properties on the north side of Russell, like you may have thought that you wanted to just have a house behind you, but the community plan, the zoning plan, the historic zoning commission plan, none of those things supported that information for you. You needed to purchase a house <coughs> in a different area within Edgefield. Thank you, Councilman. So um, I, I request the commission's approval of the plan, which has been vetted for more than a year now from MDHA yeah. codes, Metro Historic Zoning, Planning and Public Works for more than a year. I've also had this as a standing item with all three affected neighborhood associations and I request the approval of the commission. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And you know, there may be some questions that come up but um, I really appreciate uh, you being on the call with us today and um, seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And so we'll start the um, discussion. But before we um, start the discussion with the commissioners, uh, this is not uh, a normal um, zoning case for us. So uh, I would like staff to kind of um, just kind of review kind of historically. Um, I, since I've been on the commission, I don't think that we've done one of these um and so um director kemp who do, are you going to handle that or who who uh, or is that lisa or who actually you? i think this let lisa um has helped to um to identify the zoning districts and guide sort of the land use discussion so let me let me ask lisa to help and Lisa, it might be useful in your overview to um note that there were a couple of areas where the council member expressed an interest in um, sort of revisiting and, and what that would mean just sort of organizationally as well. So the commission kind of understands some of the choices in front of us. 
Thank you. Sure, and I'm going to go back to um, this map, which shows, um, it gives you a breakdown of the existing zoning districts and uh, what they are proposed to be zoned to. And so you have um, this sort of law, uh, light peach area that is, um, so you can see the legend at the bottom. So you can get a correlation between what the existing is and what it's proposed. And then the last slide, that I had up shows you what the zoning would look like um, if this if this rezoning were to be in place. And so you see that a large majority of the area would be rezoned to MULA. Um, and now for, for a lot of that area, you already have CS zoning, especially along Woodland running up into five points. And then you also have existing MUL zoning. Uh, for, for, so for the most part, what you're dealing with with the part that would go to MULA is property that is already zoned CS or MUL. There's a couple of spots of CN that are thrown in there as well but and CL, but for the most part, you're dealing with a large area of CS along Woodland Street. And let's just talk about Woodland Street for a second. Um, as a council member mentioned most of Woodland Street is covered by the, the Woodland Street is covered by a couple of different redevelopment districts um, quite a bit of it in the um, five point redevelopment district which is the redevelopment district that will be expiring at the end of the year so the way to think about a redevelopment district is for instance if you have this CS zoned property CS permits certain uses including things like um, used car lots uh, auto service sort of a more auto oriented type of use when you add a redevelopment district on top of that, what it does is that it further restricts the land uses. And so in other words, within that CS area along Woodland Street, while a auto service may be permitted by the base zoning, the redevelopment district is gonna restrict it so that that use wouldn't be permitted. It's not, it, it is not lining up with their land use plan for the redevelopment district. And so in this case where you have a redevelopment district that is expiring, if it expires, then some of those protections that are given by the redevelopment district are lost. And so those sorts of things would be things like those prohibitions of uses. Additionally, a CS zoning is one of our more, um, a more suburban style zoning districts in that it doesn't have a build to line, which is something that we see a lot more frequently in urban areas. It has a setback line. It has some bulk standards um, that are things that are a little more uh, suburban in nature. The height on CS is based on a height control plane where the building is pushed back from the street. And so some of those things are also covered by the redevelopment district. And so you're adding in sort of layers of design guidelines and use guidelines with the redevelopment district. If those are, if the, if the redevelopment district is lost, then you're left with a more suburban style commercial auto oriented zoning along Woodland Street. By proposing to rezone it to MULA, the MULA district is more in line with what the redevelopment district is actually controlling now in regards to both uses as well as form. Um, and so, so you're sort of putting back into place through a different tool, some of those standards that you currently have that are governed by the redevelopment district. Something else to keep in mind with um, MULA and CS, and Patrick spoke to this um, briefly, um, should the um, redevelopment district be removed and you have the CS, those properties that are along Woodland that are zoned CS are eligible for something that is called adaptive residential. And what that is, is it means that if you're zoned CS and you're located along an arterial or a collector and Woodland's a collector, then you're allowed to build residential multifamily by right. And you do not have an FAR maximum for that residential multifamily. So in other words, where a lot of our, where zoning districts have FAR, which is the floor area, of what could be built. If you're building multifamily in CS zoning, you don't actually have a floor area max. Um, you would be governed by some of the bulk standards, but you don't have that floor area 
So MULA does have a floor area max and residential uses are not exempted. And so while you may have a bit more um, FAR that's available just by comparing a CS to MUL straight across the board, MULA, there is that consideration of the fact that adaptive residential is available and would not have an FAR maximum. And so that's just one of the areas that I really that we that we really wanted to focus on. The other areas um, where you can see this would be the the final um, proposed zoning. <clears throat> we've got a couple of areas where we've already got um, CN, and those are sort of those neighborhood nodes of commercial that are currently zoned CN. Uh, one a couple zoned MUM. Those are proposed to be to go to MUNA. Um, and so that would be um, CN, again, like CS, is a more suburban style zoning. And so an MUNA is going to create some of those better streetscapes and building forms um, than a CN. Um, and then you've got on the edges, as Council Member Withers explained, a few spots of OR. 20 that are existing that would be changed to OR20A. And again, the reason that we would want to put those A districts on is so that we're getting those bulk standards and getting things pulled up to the street in a way that is more appropriate in an urban area. A couple of the things that I heard Councilmember Withers um, indicate that he would be willing to look at um, and that, and just keep in mind that zoning districts um, um, just keep in mind, I'm sorry, that zoning bills can be modified up to third reading at council. And so there could be changes made at council so long as they're equally restrictive to what the planning commission recommends. So in other words, if you all were to recommend approval and then the council member wanted to change some areas to include the NS designation, that's something that could happen at council and not have to come back to planning. And so a couple of the things that I think that the council member said that he would be willing to look at would be um, if there are any districts right now that don't permit uh, short-term rentals, that he would be willing to consider the application of the NS districts on those areas. And that's something that um, I can help the council member evaluate to determine if that would be appropriate. Additionally, I believe that he indicated that he would be willing to look at the CL portion of um, the CL the existing CL along Woodland Street um, to determine if the MULA or perhaps an MUNA um, would be um, more palatable. And, and so those are things that I that we can look at with him um, between now and third reading. Thank you, Lisa. Director, is there anything you want to add to that? No, thank you. Okay, well, let's go ahead and try um, discussion. We'll start with uh, Vice Chair Farr. You want to go ahead? Sure. Um, that's a lot of information to process. Um, and I am an East Nashville resident, um, so I have certainly seen and been um, seen all of the signs up and was very curious to see um, how this was all going to get pulled together. Um, and I and I do think that Councilman Withers has done a very good job of trying to um, replicate to the best extent possible at this point um, the existing redevelopment district plan, um, as well as to address some inconsistencies um, or make things more consistent overall. Um, so I'm generally supportive. I do uh, respect some of the neighbors' concerns around the property on South 10th. And I, um, so I guess one question I had about that for staff is, um, what would be the difference between a, between the CN versus the MUNA on South 10th? And why would, uh, given we have CN across the street, um, what, what would that mean? CN would be limited to just commercial uses, is that right? Or? So um, is this, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out exact, the one on South 10th um, that I thought was the area of question is currently zoned R8. Is that the one that we're talking about? That's what I was um, talking about. I okay, yes. Switching to that MUNA 
versus what's across the street, which is CN. And I don't know what the benefit to that would be or not. So the, hey, everyone, sure. uh, this is, this is Councilmember Withers. I believe that Commissioner Kamar is referring to um, right now, um, she's referring to, I believe the Commissioner Farr is referring to 210 South 10th. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Which, I've got it. Yes. Proposed to move from R8 to MENA. And what she's referring to is across the street is the former Metro Head Start facility, which currently has CN zoning. And, and that is proposed to move to, that currently has CN zoning, is removed, proposed to move to MULA. And the MULA zoning oh, oh. for the yes. former Head Start, Head Start property is supported by Metro uh, Metro's Metro government's uh, land use planners. So, hi, hi Commissioner yeah. Farr, and let me let me, th I think the map that I've got on the the screen may help a little bit too. So this map is so the black labels that are on the map are indicating what the existing zoning is. The um, the shades are, and if you'll look at the legend at the bottom, are showing what is proposed. And so the CM that's across the street from the 210 South 10th property is proposed to change to MULA, whereas the one on South 10th would go to MUNA. And so looking at um, the properties on the uh, east side, South 10th, definitely have a more um, commercial pattern now and more intense zoning. And so by um, by including, by changing those to MULA um, and then transitioning to MUNA across South, South 10th, we're able to get that transition into the more residential areas that are behind South 10th. Um, and so we sort of see that as a as a bridge, sort of a transition between the two. And so I think this map sort of helps to show um, how that transition takes place from MUL A to, to MUNA. Yes, no, that helps. Okay, sorry, I was I was getting trying to keep up with everything, but that makes sense. Um, you know, I'm certainly sensitive to the to the residents on Russell. I used to live on Russell. I know. Um, you know, in the 15 years since I've moved or, or 12 years since I've moved, uh, it's changed a lot. I understand it is it is a much busier street. Um, Woodland is busier than it was then. Um, you know, so I, I, I am very sensitive to the residents' concerns about increased development on Woodland and what, you know, shifting what that will do um, impacting Russell Street. Um, but to Councilman Withers' point, this is not necessarily anything new. I mean, it's kind of what we've known would happen all along with the um, redevelopment in East Nashville and along Woodland. Um, I guess if there are any opportunities to think about um, addressing their concerns as this continues to move through the council process, I would encourage the councilmen to do that. Um, but overall, I think, you know, this is definitely a very complicated project. Um, I can tell it's taken a tremendous amount of time and energy on the part of staff and the councilmen. And um, I think I'm generally supportive of the direction that we're going. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Payne. I think Patrick did an excellent job in his uh, presentation. I know Councilman Withers has worked diligently over the past year uh, and given very little opposition um, and a very complicated analysis. I'm going to support staff's recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if you would, I think Lisa or uh, uh, Patrick, uh, bring up the uh, map, show a uh, proposed rezoning you know, uh, from current zoning to proposed zoning, uh, the color coded one. Yes, thank you. So I am uh, in agreement of some like MUL to MULA, and also OR20 to OR20A, RM20 to RM20A. That, you know, makes sense because existing, uh, five points uh, redevelopment district that is mostly I 
believe it like, more like a design guideline, uh, how the parking access should be, how the you know front look like, how streetscaping look like. But as far as I know, uh, according to the document from the MDHA, the underlying base zoning continue to govern the land use. So only difference is uh, like a, um, just how it looked like. So my question is, uh, I think there was uh, uh, some page to show the difference. Can you bring up the a difference from a CN to MULA? Yes, so could you explain, it says a CN is uh, FAR 0.25, but MULA is uh, one and setbacks seem to be the same. So, so built to zone is none. So if you were to imagine somebody come back and build uh, CN um, zoning, and what will be the major difference, how building will look like under the CN zoning and proposed MULA zoning? What's the difference? Sure. So if someone builds under CN zoning, what you're going to be dealing with is that, that there's not a build to zone for CN. There's actually a setback for CN. And so you could end up with a building that's set back from the street with parking in front of the building. Um, CN is just a much more um, suburban style zoning district as opposed to MULA. And so this one may seem like a big jump, but you have to look at it in the context of where it is within the area. And so we're sort of looking at this corner and this corner here. Um, and if you look at surrounding zonings of MUL, um, changing those to go to MULA is more consistent with the land use policy and the surrounding zoning. Um, but CN would be inconsistent with both the intent of the the redevelopment district and CN would also be inconsistent with the land use policy. Okay, um, could you show me the uh, C uh, L two M U L? I think that's the east edge of so. So under this CL and MULA, what will be the major difference? It looks like under Commissioner Wither. Oh my God. <laughs> Commissioner Assistant Councilmember Withers. Yes, I'm asking the question to uh, our staff. Yeah, no, Councilmember Withers. Let me. I I, I understand. And I think that uh, in, for the CL, I think Commissioner Johnson is asking a really good question, but it has different applications and two different areas of the overall plan area. So one area is the, there is a, there is a CL area west of 8th Street on Woodland. That is CL. Almost all of those properties are historic homes that are protected by the historic Edgefield Preservation Zoning District. Um, so the buildings themselves are going to remain, which is hey, good. Council, Councilman Withers, so we're, we're on discussion with the commissioners. And so yes. unless unless there's a, a question really directed towards you, we have to just that's that's our policy. Just like I, in I understand. I okay. understand what I, what I was trying you. to point out is that uh, for the CL policy on Woodland, there's one specific implication because of the historic preservation zoning that's already in place, whereas Thank the CL at 10th and Woodland, it's a different implication. Okay. But thank you. I appreciate that. So if I may uh, continue asking our staff the question, because that, you know, two CL zone, I am uh, specifically interested in CL proposed uh, behind the Russell Street. So that specific uh, 
west side of the portion will change, propose to change from CL to MULA. So uh, if I'm reading correct, it's a max height is 30 feet at setback. And MULA is three story in 45 feet. So how does it look like? So does it go to up to 45 feet under the proposed MULA while CL is I'm trying to understand. So CL again, so in this area, um, CL would be allowed to have um, adaptive residential um, with unlimited FAR um, because it's on Woodland Street, which is a collector. Um, and so the part on Woodland Street would be eligible for adaptive residential because it is on a collector. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would be um, able to, um, you can actually get some alternative design if you're doing adaptive residential. Um, and so with CL, um, if you're not doing residential, what the height looks like is that you have a maximum height that is set back and then you can go up higher um, the further you get back from the road. And so you sort of end up with what we what we refer to as a bit of a wedding cake design where as you step back, you're able to go higher. Um, and so so for instance, you could have taller um, as you move away from Woodland Street. And so it's really difficult to sort of say like, this is exactly what a building's gonna look like because you have different things that go into play, such as, um, you know, not only the FAR, but also if they're gonna have any parking, um, the type of use it is, the maximum height, that sort of thing. But I think that just generally what we can say is that the commercial districts, um, are um, the CL, the CS, the CN are, are sort of more suburban wherein they allow parking in the front of buildings. I also did want to um, point out um, uh, this uh, map where some of the conversation that you were asking about was around, so the part that is this portion in the south here that's going to CL, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. All of that is within um, historic districts. And so um, even if it goes to MULA, those standards are still reviewed against the standards of the historic um, overlay district. And so the, one of the reasons that we wanted to show this map was because you do have large areas um, that are covered by historic districts. And so, yes, we're setting up base zoning districts that may vary from the existing base zoning districts, but um, you also have the design guidelines for the historic districts that will remain in place. Okay, so in that uh, say, uh, same token, uh, there are several uh, neighborhood com existing commercial CN zoning in Father and Street was 16th and 14th. So I think a long time ago, you know, people uh, thought it would be a great idea to have like a corner market or a coffee shop or a restaurant, you know, in each uh, center of the neighborhood. So in that token, since it is within the uh, historic zoning overlay, even though it was changed to MULN, uh, it will be a uh, design guide, historic overlay will uh, dictate a design guideline. Am I understand correctly? Yes, that's correct. If there's a historic district in place, then anything that comes before them, and those those CNs, those little pockets are, are primarily CN to MUN with one little bit of, of MUL, but that's where MUL sort of already exists to go to MULA. Um, but the CN to MUNA, those little pockets are, um, if they're within a historic district, then yes, the historic guidelines are going to prevail regardless of what the base zoning is. Okay. Uh Okay, now I'm getting that you know, full picture. So as far as uh, you know, CS to MULA on uh, both north and south side of Woodland Street. So because Woodland being um, 
uh, you know, collector street, you know, major street. So that's why uh, MUL, MUL is more appropriate than MUN. Uh, that's the uh, reason behind uh, MUL versus MUN. Because I thought, you know, uh, being behind historic, uh, established historic uh, residential zoning, you know, some area it might be appropriate for MUN uh, rather than MUL. So I just wanted to know the reason behind those uh, why you recommend MUL instead of MUL. So MUL A would be closer to CS, especially considering that that is a collector where you're allowed to do adaptive residential. And so MUL A would be closer. I mean, you have to also keep in mind that there would be appropriate buffers required or buffers if required. And some of the properties that are along Woodland are also within um, historic uh, districts. If you sort of move down. Um, Woodland Street. The ones that we're talking about are sort of are in this area here, but it was it was really trying to look at the existing zoning um, and um, the existing entitlements and trying to translate it as closely as possible. You already also have, um, if you look at sort of the MUG along Main Street, trying to make a transition from MUG to MUN. Um, is a little bit of a more stark transition versus MUGA to MULA. And so we, we're always sort of looking at how we're transitioning into things. Okay. Yeah, that uh, explains a lot. So, yeah, because, you know, in our pocket, we didn't have this color coded, you know, from existing uh, zoning to proposed zoning, although, you know, we could uh, obtain that from uh, development tracker. So I was studying, but I tried to make sense out of, you know, proposed change. The only thing I wish, uh, you know, I understand Councilman Weathers has been working so hard to, you know, make it change before the current design guideline expire. Uh, only I wish is, you know, there might be still uh, an unanswered question from a neighborhood association. So I wish there was more, you know, a discussion uh, before moving forward. So I would have loved to hear more understanding and more neighborhood support before we move in. So that's, uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Chair Atkins, this is uh, Councilmember Withers. I know that this is not can, normally my time to speak, but I, I was really happy does. to respond to Council to well, Commissioner Johnson's comments. Well, we, I, I feel like at the end of our discussion, you know, we, we, we the commissioners need to follow up with all of their discussion first, Councilman, because it's. It's it's a planning commission. It's not a council meeting, and we try to I try to give lots of leeway to council members. But this is not a running debate. This is a planning commission meeting. Um, so if if you would please respect our portion to discuss it, and then I'll come back to you. Okay. I understand, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Lawson, you're recognized. Boy, I tell you, this is a phenomenal discussion. Uh, and most of my questions or concerns have been answered, particularly since the staff did an outstanding job and there's an opportunity for some tweaking once it gets to council. So I'm kind of leaning toward uh, agreeing with the staff recommendation. I'm gonna listen some more, but that's where I stand now. Thank you, Commissioner, appreciate that. Commissioner Sims. Yes, sir, because my family and I own properties in this area, I'm recusing myself. Thank you. Commissioner Blackshear. Thanks, Chair. Um, as you have pointed out, this has definitely been discussed uh, very thoroughly by staff and, of course, by the councilmen and by um, prior commissioners. And I would really especially like to thank um, the neighbors who called in and who sent in emails. Obviously, this is a big deal and a lot of people have spent a lot of time and attention in trying to get this right. Um, 
for all the reasons that have been previously discussed, I'm generally supportive of it, but um, I am encouraged by the councilman's willingness to continue to listen to the neighbors and their concerns on certain um, parcels in the um, in the proposal. So, I, I mean, it sounds like that's what the councilman is planning to do. And so I'm encouraged um, that he is planning on doing that. So I am generally supportive of the staff's recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. And so um, now we'll go back so that the councilman can has closing remarks. Councilman, closing. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I appreciate every, every Really, I mean, first and foremost, I, I just appreciate the uh, attention and the um, dedication of our planning department staff who have spent the better part of a year with me working through this alongside MDHA, the Metro Historic Zoning Commission, the codes department staff, um, public work staff. Everyone is focused on um, making sure that once, generally once the redevelopment, the five points redevelopment district expires, that frankly, what we're looking for is to see no no change in expectations. Um, in some cases, what we're looking at is because the five points redevelopment district boundaries were drawn in ways that made sense 20 years ago that, that don't make sense today. We're looking at entire block faces just to make sure that it makes sense across an entire block face rather than what were the site conditions 20 or 30 or 35 years ago. So I just appreciate the, the planning staff, codes, public works, historic zoning, everyone working together. We are all on the same page. We all get it for what the neighborhoods were trying to do at that time and what they're trying to do today. And everyone is really on the same page and we all believe that you know that the the proposed zone changes based on changes um, further and continue the work of the five points redevelopment district or in some cases east bank which extends along woodland or whatnot or the overall uh, neighborhood center policy area along 10th and 11 both sides of 10th and 11th uh, through nashville next so everyone's really is on the same page just saying like we want to look at what the community has consistently communicated over 20 or 30 or 35 years, which is that they want fairly intense mixed uses along woodland and that they want um, a little bit less, but still, you know, pretty intense mixed uses along 10th and 11th on both sides to make those streets 10th and 11th complete streets and to make woodland a complete street and to have as much as we can, grand floor retail and with residential above to really make the Five Points area the urban uh, mixed use district that the community envisioned specifically in the RUDAP that occurred in 1999 following the, the 1998 tornado. That is explicitly what the RUDAP convened by the American Institute of Architects called for. And so that, that's what this is. It's just saying, like, how do we do this today using the new base zoning tools and technologies that we have today that we didn't have 20 or 30 years ago? Yeah, that makes um, sense. And, and so that's, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. And so, I, I, you know, you can't always make everyone totally happy with everything uh, on yeah. anything. I have neighbors who would like things on Woodland to be less dense. I have neighbors who would like things on Woodland to be MUGA. They're like, why aren't you making it all MUGA? Because you could. And, and really, like myself and the planning staff in particular, have really been focused on, like, let's, let's not give people more uses uh, and intensity than they're allowed currently. We have been very diligent about saying, like, let's do the most literal translation that we can from the old technology and the old plans to the new technology. Yeah. And, and I, I'm really proud of the effort that everyone, all of these metro departments, especially the metro planning staff, have put forward to do this. And I think that this plan that's presented to you today, um, with, with a few exceptions that I've explained in my letter, which is about five points long, but all those exceptions yeah. are OR20 as a, as a transition policy. But I, I think that we can all be proud of where we've ended up 
with this yes. recommendation uh, to the Metro Council. So I, I just encourage the commissioners to recommend approval of the staff recommendation and welcome any further questions that the commissioners have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I think everyone has, has spoken. Um, Commissioner Farr, do you wanna try to do a, um, a motion? Sure, I'm here. Yeah, I'm, I'm muting everything. Oh, okay, um, <laughs> I will make a motion that we approve staff's recommendation. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Mr. Haynes? Second. Commissioner Haynes seconds the motion. That's a proper Second, motion. yes. And second. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other discussion? If you would raise your by the commissioners, if you'd raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to discuss. It was a very robust conversation. I appreciate that. Seeing no other discussion, we are ready for a roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. And Commissioner Sims is recusing herself. The chair votes aye, ayes have it, and it is approved. Thank you, Councilman, we appreciate you being on the line. Now we are going to the last portion of our meeting, which is under other business, and anything on historic? Commissioner Johnson. Mr. Chairman, no, uh, no report at this time, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Parts. Um, the big news is we are trying to revisit our naming policy. In 2007, we passed a policy to never rename a park. Um, so we are looking at modifying that policy in order to rename parks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, executive committee. Um, Vice Chair, I don't think we have anything other than just um, holidays are coming up. So obviously we only have one meeting in November and then one meeting in December. So they potentially could be a little longer. Um, anything else, Vice Chair? No, not for me. Okay. And and just a reminder, we're, our, our plan is to do these particular meetings, teleconference through the end of the year and then see where we are with um, that's where the uh, governor would have to renew his executive order. So we'll keep y'all updated. Lucy, anything else? I, that That's it on executive committee. Director's report, anything, Lucy? Sure, just um, two things uh, briefly. First, I wanted to extend a warm uh, welcome to Catherine Herman, who some of you may see online. Catherine is joining our land development section um, as a senior planner, and we'll be working closely with Lisa. Catherine has uh, 14 years of experience in both public and private sector, um, and we welcome her. Um, we are working to uh, restructure the land development section just a bit, and Sean Shepard, um, who has so capably served in that role, is going to um, continue to work on cases with us, but um, those relating more to text amendments and sort of broader policy issues and the like, which I think is a strength for her as, and, and will help position the department to better be able to respond to larger um, sort of zoning requests from council members and the like. Um, that we welcome Catherine, acknowledge that this is an unusual time to start in a, in a new role. And um, we have several other new staff and I'll introduce them at the next meeting. Um, so that's one. Two, I just wanted to give the commissioners a quick heads up there are, um, now that we've completed the Dickerson um, study, we are turning towards other parts of the city where we have long range planning needs. Um, we're, um, I think, proceeding more cautiously than we would in typical circumstances because we do wanna make sure that our engagement is a credible process. So we're looking at neighborhoods and corridors in the Southeast, as well as Edge Hill, um, where there's outstanding planning work that needs to be accomplished. Um, and then the last thing I would note is the planning department is um, going to be working with several um, other departments on a collaborative effort um, evaluating the East Bank. 
And so we're going to be managing um, some of the work, but in partnership with other, other departments. And so um, that's interesting and exciting. And I'm happy to brief you more, more fully once we get um, down the road a bit there. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that we're, we're working on it. Like I said, I think we are taking a cautious approach because we want to make sure that communities, um, you know, feel comfortable working through a remote format. So, but we understand the work needs to be done. So that's all for me. Thank you very much for your service as always to the city. And thank you to ITS. Uh, reiterate what the chairman said. Um, we couldn't hold these meetings without ITS's support. And we're just really grateful to, to Kevin today. Excellent. And I, I want to welcome Catherine as well. And we look forward to working with her. Um, and then I also, um, the director and I have spoken about, we'll make sure that we keep everybody in the loop on um, the East Bank and, and any anything else, the commissioners and, of course, the public. And so be expecting some emails and make sure you all pay attention to those. Um, and so thank you, Director. That was great. And so lastly, I don't think the council lady is on the line. So... We have, we have finished our meeting, and next meeting is December 10th, um, so uh, we'll see you all there, and is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, it's proper Second. Second. We are adjourned. Watch. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.